of in a branch like ophthalmology you know which is a ever changing and ever evolving branch in fact in my own uh, you know interest that is vitreo retina by the time we settle with one anti vegf already the second one is coming in the market and there is talk about another one so i'm sure the same goes for all sub specialties in ophthalmology so keeping that in mind we've chosen uh, five prominent sub specialties that is glaucoma cataract retina cornea and oculoplasty and we have we have invited some of the best and the pioneers in their fields to speak to you about the therapeutics in their respective uh, sub specialities uh before i uh, before we start before i go on to introduce them uh, a couple of uh, technical uh, uh, things is that uh, like every time the pattern of our webinar is going to be in every uh, sub specialty we are going to have a talk for 15 minute and then that will be followed by a 5 minute uh, uh, discussion and question and answer session i urge all the audiences to type their queries in the chat box so that we can uh, you know compile all these queries while the talk is going on and then take up the question and answers i request the moderators of each sub specialty to keep an eye on the chat box during that particular talk so that it will be easier for the question and answers to be asked uh also you know normally the formalities are done at the end but i would like to thank our in right in the beginning thank our industry partner for today that is novartis uh somewhere down the webinar i would like them also to have a quick word with all of us regards the mmc credit points this is the second webinar which is uh, you know which has we are we are giving the mmc credit point for the attendees we will be having an mmc observer in our mix and as per the mmc guidelines so apnesh correct me if i am uh, wrong anywhere as per the mmc guidelines we will be taking screenshots at every half an hour to ensure the attendance throughout the seminar so i request everyone to attend for the entire duration so that brings us to the first section of our today's uh, uh, webinar and that is glaucoma uh, we have with us uh, for glaucoma dr sushmita kaushik and dr rajul parik welcome uh, dr sushmita kaushik is professor and a faculty in the glaucoma services at pgi chandigarh for the last 16 years has a tremendous amount of experience behind her she has been the secretary of the glaucoma society of india among her special interests are newer diagnostic tools childhood glaucoma angle closure glaucoma and glaucoma surgery she has more than 80 peer reviewed publications and more than 30, 30 she has 32 chapters in various textbooks regarding dr rajul parekh he is our own boi member so he, i think he needs no introduction but i have to do the formalities he is a glaucoma specialist of great repute in mumbai he did his fellowship from the lund university in sweden and has been and, and was a glaucoma consultant in the elvi prasad eye institute for 4 years thereafter he is a director of shriji eye clinic and palax glaucoma care center at andheri he is a society editor for the prestigious international glaucoma review journal he has more than 70 peer reviewed publications to his credit and numerous awards to name a few the fdc award for glaucoma therapeutics and the bell pharma award for glaucoma surgical innovations so i welcome you both and i request dr sushmita kaushik to start her presentation the topic for today as per our theme is newer drugs and lasers in glaucoma so dr sushmita please share your screen i will be uh, introducing our other faculties as 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 and when their sub specialty start madam you can unmute yourself sapnesh please unmute yeah. yourself yes yeah, she can she can yeah can you see a message ma'am yeah yeah no yes that's it go ahead ma'am right good morning again and uh, thank you very much boa for having me on board thank you dr rahul uh, rajul for the invite so he stopped he actually the topic given was lasers and medical management but as you know the passion is always surgical so i've sneaked in with uh, dr rajul's permission so i i am sorry for that but anyway we look at glaucoma challenges and why we need to look beyond because that's the first thing that uh, everything is going well why do we need to go beyond it 
and what has been tried in the present time and what is feasible. So the problem is the glaucoma patient is not easy, despite most people thinking what's a big deal, because there's no treatment that reverses the optic neuropathy and once diagnosed, it remains a glaucoma patient. So we don't have the luxury of sending him back and saying, okay, bye, have a good life, because that life is up to us to make good. And they need to be treated for the rest of their lives. And though we have lowering IOP, which is the mainstay, it's sobering that it's not the only thing that is responsible. And sometimes it is hard to lower pressures despite all that we've done. The lifespan of patients is increasing. So the age-related disease prevalence increases and adds to the economic burden. And in a child, the journey is a little harder. So the options we have are medication, lasers, and surgery, and each has its own set of problems. So let's go on to the medication first. The first thing is cost and availability. The compliance, even if they can afford, they're not compliant with it. Sometimes the glaucoma is simply refractory and medications don't work enough. And allergy and side effects are a real problem. So everything might be all right. Your glaucoma is not progressing. Your medication is affordable. And yet the patient comes back. So this is uh, after bimetoprost, you have these lashes and you need to do something about it. So the problems with the current um, formulations available are the permeability issues. Only three to 5% enter the eye. So 80% is either systemically absorbed or washed out. So you need something more sustainable. And then with the elderly, there's difficulty in instilling only 39% of patients have actually managed to put in a drop without touching the adnexa, and one third who thought they didn't miss actually did. So um, I'm just uh, quickly going through no finance, financial um, benefits from any of these medications, but I've just put in this useful table. These are the preservatives we have. Uh, it's a chloride, purine, and sofzia. These are, uh, this is the detergent which causes the maximum problems, and it causes corneal epithelial breakdown and tear film instability but it has excellent broad antimicrobial efficacy as well. So in a country like ours, where infections and temperature uh, maintenance is a problem, be sure that it's the benzyl conium chloride that makes your drop the safest, despite causing the maximum problems. So all the ones that you can think of, Lumigia, Antimoptin, Xalatan, these are just some of the, the brands available. Purite and Sofzia still have mild cytotoxic activity and the examples which they say are preservative free, actually have this preservative, notable is alphagon P and maybe Travitan Z. So the cost issues in India, I've just broken this down. For example, Xalatan or Latinoprost, which is the most commonly used uh, prostaglandin analog. In dollars, it's $60 in the US, 12 in Canada, 24 in UK, and just six and a half dollars in India. So you can't really blame the companies that much. They do try to cost reduce and cost reduced to about a tenth of what is available in the US, but even this tenth of the cost is usually out of bounds for our people. So what about the new drugs? You have new classes of medications, but I don't think they're likely to resolve the issues that I've talked about. So I'd like to just highlight the main. One is a rho kinase inhibitor, one is a latinoprostine bunod. Now this is a nitric oxide releaser, and this is a rho kinase or enzymes that control cell shape and movement. So they, it's, it's thought that these inhibitors are going to improve a trabecular outflow by uh, increasing the outflow by changing the cell shape. And the most important ones there are metasudil and riposudil. Riposudil was, was formulated in Japan primarily. Netasudil is an American product. This is available as rho pressa. So Interest budon were both FDA latinoprostine budon plus latinoprost. So the enuviosclerol as well as the conventional outflow are increased at the same time. So you can imagine if you combine this with the timolol or naqueous suppressant, this is likely to be good. So the next thing is sustained release medications, and this may circumvent some of the problems. So long-term release of a glaucoma medication that can be injected either subcontinually, and if it's sustained for three to four months, it is ideal and it can bypass the issues of adherence and compliance. So what has been tried? In the long-term releases, you have liposomal nanocarriers for latinoprost, 
And a single subconjunctival injection in rabbits increased the efficacy, which lasted 90 days. So even that, the one subconj injection, if for three months the patient can be medication-free, that will be a huge thing if it comes in. There are polyester microspheres, which are encapsulating timolol. Again, one microsphere subconjunctively released for more than 90 days. And there is an implantable dorsolamide disc, but in vivo, the effect stayed only for 10 days in animal experiments. So in the pipeline for sustained release drugs, which have reached phase one trials, or phase three are underway in some of them, there's bimetoprost SR. It's a biodegradable implant in the anterior chamber. Everybody's very excited about this because the duration is targeted at six months. So twice year anterior chamber injection. And if it stays and lasts, that will be great. So IDOS is from Blockos. It's a non-renewable anterior chamber implant, which you can implant, impregnate with any drug that you want. Then there's a bimetoprost ring, which is periocular in the conjunctiva. There's a punctal plugs, which have these uh, drugs in them and you just insert it into the puncture and it keeps releasing and then this travel cross has come out with a biodegradable uh, implant in the anterior chamber as well and all these targeted durations are almost 6 to 12 months so let's see when they reach the clinical setting what happens so uh, the other thing is a drug reservoir that's another exciting uh, area these are ocular mini drug pumps the principle is of electrolysis and you need to just refill a port four to six weekly. And it's similar to implanting a GDD, but it has a port which can be refilled outside in the conjunctiva. So it's, it stays inside the eye and you just refill it or inject it and that's what should work. Coming to lasers, uh, LPI of course is our bedrock of laser therapy because angle closure comprises half of all our primary glaucomas. Trabeculoplasty, currently what's available is the SLT, which is Q-switched, and you also have a micropulse trabeculoplasty, which is similar to SLT, but uses a diode. And then, of course, there's cyclophotocoagulation. Nowadays, what has come in is micropulse transcleral CPC, and the technology is that instead of continuous wave diode, it's short multiple pulses and apparently has lesser thermal destruction. So coming to the SLT, which is what the micropulse is also going to do, this was what the ALT, the argon laser trabeculoplasty was, and this is what the SLT is. The difference is that it selectively targets the pigmented trabecular meshwork. And since the pigmented meshwork is the filtering portion, you assume that uh, reorganizing that filtering portion would uh, work. So this is just a short video showing uh, uh, this is the end point of the SLT, so I thought this was a nice video to show. These are what the champagne bubbles are. And this is a large spot, 400 microns, targeting the entire trabecular meshwork tissue. So when you have these, these champagne bubbles that come up, your laser energy is adequate. And we hope that it's just want to caution against it. It's a wonderful tool. We've been using it for years and years and years now. But we've learned how to use it. And as for any technology, that's important. So this is just uh, demonstrating a patient who had come with post-DLCP hypotony. And we thought we'd look at the UBM to see what had happened. And actually there was supraciliary fluid all around, but to our horror, uh, this is what we saw. This cavitation here is in the ciliary body. So this is the destruction and you can see destruction of ciliary processes there. Now this is what the pop does. So when you hear a pop, please, please reduce the laser energy and recognize that the pop means Extensive destruction. So this is in an area of the pop. You can see supraciliary fluid. This is the area of untreated ciliary body, the supranasal quadrant, which of course has but for our adults. And this is how we mark it out. So you can see how far back the ciliary body is. And if you go by the DNO 1.5 millimeters, many times you're targeting sclera and not targeting tissue or ciliary processes like you want to. So the micropulse CPC has come in now. This is the difference in the laser wavelengths. Again, it increases outflow. There's no ciliary body destruction. That's what it said. And it supposedly acts on the longitudinal fibers of the ciliary muscle displaces the spur in a posterior direction and modifies the configuration of the trabecular meshwork, much like pilocarpine does. 
So this effect has maximally been seen at 150 joules, but be very careful because we have seen, and I'd like to share that we've seen retinal detachments in young children or young people when we started doing this with the demo machine. And I think it is because of the pull on the ciliary muscle, you might also be pulling on the peripheral retina in the stretched eyes, which you have to be careful about. So coming to surgery, this is attractive because it looks like a one-time magic wand, as all surgeons would like to think. There are risks and complications. There's, a, there's an issue of adequate training for glaucoma surgery. And it's not a quick fix solution because the heart of glaucoma surgery lies in its post-operative management. So there are many failures if not followed up and followed up well enough. And then the, the uh, problem is that the patient has a false sense of uh, security also. So these are some of the problems of a trap which you do. There's no surgeon who will tell you mirror traps are fine. You can't be fine. Anybody who does trabeculectomies does come up with these problems and these issues of leaks, of uh, hypotenuse plebs, of excessive scarring. And children are a different challenge altogether. So there are at least hundreds of diseases which are all grouped under childhood glaucoma. All of them are different and all of them, you have a responsibility of holding their hands throughout their life. So that's a different ball game. So everything about new surgery is to spare conjunctiva for some strange reason. And we know the strange reason is because the conjunctiva is the villain for a glaucoma surgeon. So minimally invasive glaucoma surgery, mix. And I think in the next decade or so, this is going to really hit us with a bang. The idea is minimal disruption of conjunctiva, sclera, and iris. They're all angle-based surgeries or they're translimbal surgeries. Angle-based surgeries, we must understand, bypasses abnormal trabecular meshwork, whereas translimbal surgeries bypasses the normal outflow completely and forms a conjunctival filtration plan. But none of these precludes further surgery. So the options for mix that we have now are the goniotomy and the trabectome and the Kahoo dual blade, I think LB Prasad has got one, so Dr. Rashmi is doing that, but it's not available in India currently. None of the others are available commercially in India, but we'll just go over that quickly. And translimbal fistulizing is, a, is an exciting thing that's coming up, the Zen implant, and the pressor flow micro shunt developed by Paul Palmer, which is also considered to be a mana of glaucoma surgery. Very, very expensive as yet, and I'm sure it's the cost issue which they are trying to work on. So the prerequisites for MIGS is a direct gonioscopy. So I'm very happy about that, that it will force everybody to do a gonioscopy, which I wish more people did right now. So for the direct gonioscopy, the microscope is tilted, the head is tilted to the opposite side so that if this is the angle, you basically need the angle to be in your line of sight. So this is, this is the Zeiss uh, Lumera. I'm sure all microscopes will have that. So you tilt it away if you have to operate and the child's head is tilted the other side. And then the direct gonioscope has to be held in the non-dominant hand, in this case the left, and then you do your surgery with the right hand. And I'm glad for once glaucoma surgery looks as complicated as it does. So this is goniotomy. This is in an Axenfeld reader. Just a quick uh, video to demonstrate that this is a very high iris insertion. And you can see this cleft that is formed. So it's ab internal, conjunctiva not, not touched. You can see we've gone in and there you are. So this is the cleft that forms in the, in the angle. And basically it's the mother of all mix. It's the first minimally invasive glaucoma surgery, which has worked for years and years. It doesn't work, work in adults because this cleft is not formed so well because it's not a growing eye. And the, the slice that you do to the trabecular meshwork tends to scar down. So you can see this is the cut and this is the uncut area. You can see the cleft that is formed. So I just move forward. This is the angle before and this is the angle after. So this is how it's opened up. This is what MIX wants us to do open up trabecular meshwork. We've had an encouraging journey in babies so far. You can even do two goniotomies. We've done that as a redo surgery now. We don't go on to do the next surgery. We do a goniotomy in the untreated angle. So the trabectome has the same principles of goniotomy. We had the, uh, the opportunity of using it. We're going to get the machine. So sometime later, I, I hope to share our experience. But this is with the demo machine we had. So this is for adults, and instead of slicing the trabecular meshwork, 
you use plasma energy to ablate it. So you just go in and it can be done under topical as well, except that you need to be careful about the patient uh, movement because it's very, very uh, delicate, so to say. So here you go in and the same Bonio lens, this is a Swan Jacob lens. And then you engage this little bit of a spur into the trabecular meshwork. So it's important to identify the structures well. So under the schwa base, this is the anterior non-pigmented and this is the posterior pigmented. So just above the root of the iris, you go into the, into the pigmented trabecular meshwork area because that's where the schlems will be behind. And then as in a moment, you'll see it go in. And as it goes in, you just switch on the laser energy and there you go. So this is trabecular meshwork which is being ablated and this is the cleft that is formed there. We've of course been at a slight advantage because we've been doing goniotomies. So for us it was child's play, but it does have a bit of a learning curve and we need to learn which is the area and which to open up. The last thing on surgery is again ab internal, even for a failed bleb, the options you have is needling and revision. And we've completely switched to an ab internal bleb revision because we don't like to touch the conjunctiva too much. The only requisite for that is you need a patent sclerostomy because if you have a scleral flap that is down and the tenons which is down, you need something to go ab internal. The principle is that you put an instrument inside the sclerostomy and open it up from inside. So this is a Grover Feldman spatula developed by Dr. Devinder Grover. It's available in India now by Epsilon. So I, if anybody's interested, they can just ask them. And uh, we just inflate that. So this is the, the failed bleb that I showed you, a lot of fibrosis. We would have gone in with a full revision or a retrap, but now this is what we do. So we, again, here the, direct, the indirect gonio lens is used to visualize the, the sclerostomy. So once the instrument is right across the anterior chamber, then you put in the gonio lens and you need to so to determine where the instrument is going to get in. And once we know that, here we are. So we've gone in to the sclerostomy and now we'll just take the gonioscope out. So this is an indirect operating gonioscope, any indirect uh, gonioscope which you want to claim and use for surgery because you need to see the opposite side. And then this is advanced under the scleral flap. And once it goes under, with gentle rocking, you first open up the scleroscleral flap beneath. And once this is opened up, you'll see the blue tip of this spatula go right beyond. And in a couple of seconds, we'll see that it goes right beyond and then goes into the subtenons. So you open up the scleral flap and then you go beyond the scleral flap and you open up the subtenon space as well. So, with, so here it is. Now that you see this blue thing here, you know that this spatula has gone beyond the scleral flap and gently you start your, it's like a needling but you haven't violated the conjunctiva externally. And then you just go in gently and there you are. And here it is. So, so then you just go on and uh, as your needling procedure, open up the sub space as well. So it takes a little bit of time and patience because uh, you might go right through and have an iridodialysis if you're not careful because it's pretty, pretty, um, uh, firm there so it's very very gently and just follow the the plane that you formed and just carry on with it and you can already see the bleb forming and I can feel the eye and there you are a bit of a bleed which tells you the eye is firm now and then you just need to uh, hydrate the board so this is what it looks like you can see all this fluid there next morning and this is over two months now we have about nine months follow-up since we started doing them and we're very happy. None of the patients that we've done so far really needed any uh, uh, medication or surgery after that. So to summarize the goals of newer management, it is important to bypass patient factors of adherence and compliance. That is one where medicine is concerned and minimize the toxicity as well. And surgically to enhance surgical success by limiting fibrosis and minimizing complications. So let's look at the possibilities and work and embrace whatever works for us. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Dr. Rajiv, sir. Okay. So.
um uh, sushmita it was a very nice talk pritam can i do i have to ask question at the end na yes 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 we have time okay please go so just you know it was a really nice talk and we'll have the question answer at the end of the all the talk thanks uh, sushmita are, are, are you sure rajul you want to take up few questions we have a question i think i know i saw the questions so yeah. you want to take me now yeah 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 I, okay yeah. so uh, uh sushmita there is one question sir uh, has been asked that can you talk about the recent complications of migs i believe uh, must be re- related to the compass trial so you know that cypas was withdrawn because of the because endothelial of state of endothelial yeah, yeah. So, so can you so i haven't really uh, read it recently but everybody knows that the the cypas was a supraciliary uh, migs which they inserted but they had a part of it which was in the anterior chamber and long term there was such a significant corneal endothelial loss that uh, this had to be withdrawn and strangely what was what was baffling to everybody was we've been using glaucoma drainage implants for years and years and uh, we haven't really seen that much of an endothelial damage so possibly because it is in the supraciliary space the implant which is inside the aqueous or inside the anterior chamber touches the cornea completely whereas in a drainage device we always target mid trabecular meshwork and make it a point that it is not it is midway between the iris and cornea so i think that was the major problem that if you have something which is abutting the cornea there will be a problem and that is why the other fistulizing procedures like the zen and the pressor flow also target mid trabecular meshwork and not the cornea so the major problem was that that it abutted the cornea because it had to go into the supraciliary space the second question is that uh, what would be the ideal time to do the ab interno blep uh, needling whenever you want to do a needling so do you have any time frame that after a certain no. time you would uh, no whenever the... whenever i have a scarred blep and i want to intervene where initially i would do a needling or a full revision we now do a uh, ab interno we don't violate the conjunctiva every time you open up the conjunctiva so if you have a failed trap then you would consider uh, ab interno needling or you consider doing a re surgery yeah yeah or... yeah yeah we've almost uh, i mean touch wood i shouldn't be saying that but uh, unless it's a very very refractory glaucoma which would not have you know it's those glaucoma which would have failed a needling which would probably require a next surgery but we've done away with external needling and done away with that violating that conjunctiva and causing more fibrosis so do you inject uh, in uh, the mitomycin so uh, mitomycin, mitomycin. Uh, no mitomycin has to be injected maybe it, it didn't i didn't highlight that mitomycin doctor in dr devendra grover's uh, uh, series and he's published two year data now you have to inject it about a, a week prior that's the only thing so what we do is when we schedule the patient we uh, inject the mmc and so that is uh, of course 0.01 so it's not 0.04 and we inject it in and then uh, with a q tip or a cotton uh, tip it is spread all over superior conjunctiva and i think the idea is you know rajul the mmc actually starts work in the first 4 5 days after a trap even though we put it in today so i think they had this one week period so that it was maximally effective at the time when they were doing the ab interno number one number two the danger of injecting mitomycin at the time of surgery is the sudden hypotony and no washing out you don't have a control over this so all that mmc is going to come into your anterior chamber and not going to stay in the tenons where you want it to so we always inject the mmc one week prior when we schedule the surgery and do so, the surgery a week later so just for the you know for the knowledge of the all the you know general audience we will just uh, specify the dilution of mmc mmc yes. okay so mmc is available as a 2 mg vial we usually use 0.02% so we just dilute the 2 mg in 10 ml and if you want to use 0.04 which is a great idea so, some people do that then you need to dilute it in 5 ml but we do a 0.02 so that's 0. 10 ml Fine. and if you want to inject it subcontinually then what we do is we dilute that further so that becomes 20 and it was 0.01 but our uh, the amount the volume is more we gave a good 0.4 to 0.5 ml spread it across right. the conjunctiva spread it all across so, so yeah. low concentration a little more amount 
I just wanted to highlight that they yeah. should be more diluted than 0.02. Yes, yes. more diluted. 20. Yeah. Yes. The second question is that uh, are you using rupacidil as a first line option? And uh, how I've happy you it. are? I'm asking questions. Yeah. So are you using an, you know, yeah. So no, if not we, as first line, do you use in certain patients? Yes, we have. Uh, to be sure, uh, it was actually, I think, released uh, just prior to the COVID time or whatever. So we haven't had too many patients to try it out, number one. And number two, I haven't been comfortable with using a new drug when I'm not calling the patients back routinely. So to be honest, I haven't used it because of the timing. I would love to. But in the few that have been, uh, you know, advanced glaucomas in which I've said, Look, rather than do surgery, let's use this drug. Uh, nothing against it, but it hasn't worked too well. I mean, I haven't been to. There has been hyperemia, but the pressure lowering hasn't been all that great. So I but, think the literature shows that ripasudil um, is not as good as netrasudil. Netrasudil. The lowering of netrasudil is yeah, much more. Much more, apparently. But anyways, so I, well, yeah. I don't so, have a very, but very you don't encouraging have, And I also have not in too many patients. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. the th thing was that uh, somebody asked that, can you share the name of the spatula? that they yes, it, yes, it's Grover Feldman. You just call up the Epsilon guy. And I think I should start taking money from them because lots of people have bought it. And, I, and they call back and say, thank you so much. It's made things so much. It's called the Grover Feldman spatula. Spatula. The difference from a cyclodialysis spatula is that the tip is completely rounded because you are going into the subcontinental space. It's not sharp at all. And it's long. It's about almost 18 millimeters so that you can go right across from the inferior limbus to up subtenons. Yeah. And the second thing, how comfortable you are using this the ab interno in a fakic patient? Okay. Not in pseudo-fakic. No, no, comfortable. No problem so with that. Always, I, I, I would always use viscoelastic and push the lens iris diaphragm back and then I would do that. No, not a problem. The third one thing that uh, you talk about the drug implant. Yeah. You think the implant will improve the, the because it will take the adherence issue out from the patient. You think uh, that it will help in a long term glaucoma? Yeah, medicine? if it is, if it is cost effective and I mean, I can put myself in their shoes. If I were a glaucoma patient and my doctor says I'll inject something every six months, fine. I'll be so happy. It'll be more comfortable. Absolutely. So it'll be more comfortable yes. counseling yes. the patient also. Yes, yes, absolutely. The only thing that uh, you said, the phase three study, I think the Allergan has um, already got FD approval. Okay, for the, all right. Okay. Uh, I think they got recently in March okay. or April. Oh, I see. Achai. The name is, uh, what is it? The Durista. The, Durista. the bimetoprost. Bimetoprost. And yes. NTH chamber implant. Yes. His name yes. is Durista. Okay. So FD has given the approval. All right. And I think yes. they had published the data where IOP reduction was 30% okay. for six months. So they don't have long-term data. Yeah. In the rapid eyes also, it was comparable to the topical. That's the, That was their randomized thing. So. Yeah. So that is randomized data. I'm saying 30%. Yeah. I think that was 12 weeks, not six months. Oh. For 12 weeks, the IOP reduction was 30%. So more or less same as the topical drops. Oh. Yeah. Mm. So there are no new question. Uh, uh, Pritam, yeah. So, if we have time and if somebody asks questions, we can take we can it at the end of the, the session. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. So thank you so Thanks. much, both of you all. Thanks, Sushmita. Okay, thank you. We move on to the next session now, and that is a cataract. And uh, we have the topic is painless cataract surgery. So, and we have none other than uh, Dr. Gaurav Luthra. I think he's a household name when it comes to ophthalmology in our uh, country. And uh, we have Dr. Kishore Pahuja, sir, all the way from Pune. Uh, they don't need introduction, but I'll just tell you a little bit about them. Gaurav Luthra is a cataract and refractive surgeon of great repute. He is uh, director of the Drishti Eye Institute at Dehradun. His special interests are refractive surgery. Besides cataract, that is refractive surgery. Pediatric cataract, keratoconus. He has been the past president of the Intraocular Implant and the Refractive Society of India. And uh, I'm sure each and every one of us has seen his live surgery demonstrations. He's done more than 200 of them so far. So welcome, dear Gaurav. Uh, you can start sharing your screen while I introduce uh, dear Dr. Kishore, sir. Uh, is, is Dr. Kishore, sir, there? Uh, Sapnesh? Yes, yes. He's there, sir. Yeah. Can you unmute him, please? Yeah. 
Gaurav sir, can you share your screen? Okay. Is perfect. Yeah, I'll just start sharing the screen. Yeah. Doctor Kishore sir is uh, yes. unmuted. Yeah. Yes. Doctor Pahuja sir, can you hear me? Uh, should I go in? Uh, have you introduced Dr. Pogacar? No, uh, no, just give me, uh, just give me half sure, a minute. Because... Sure, sure. He actually can click on the unmute and yeah. because it's allowed. Sir, Dr. Pogacar, sir, click on the unmute button so that you will come on to the, you know, the main board of, the, of our screen. I think I'll call him at the back end. Okay, just, just call him up. So, you know, Dr. Kishore Pahuja sir, is again a cataract and refractive surgeon of great repute. He's uh, been so for the past 32 years. He has done his formal comprehensive fellowship from Boston, United States. He has also been a fellow of none other than Professor Daljit Singh himself. His special interests are cataract, glaucoma, refractive surgery, and advanced imaging. He's a director of a prestigious multi-speciality hospital in Pune. Uh, I had the fortunate, uh, you know, I'm fortunate to know him since uh, I started uh, my uh, secretaryship in Maharashtra Ophthalmic Society. And he's been like a guide and mentor for me since then. So welcome Dr. Kishore Pahuja, sir. And uh, I think we, Gaurav, you can start your presentation. Sure. Uh, following your presentation, sure. then, uh, you know, we'll have a nice fruitful discussion with Dr. Kishore and you. I think he's unmuted. Sir. Yes. Hi. Good morning, sir. Yeah. Hi. Welcome. Good morning. Thank you very much for your intro. Welcome for being here on our webinar today. Thank you. And, Thank uh, you very much. Gaurav is going to start his presentation and then yeah, and then start. I'll just continue with that. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sapne, Dr. Pritham, uh, for the kind introduction and for inviting me to this uh, interesting BOA session. It looks really good. I'm going to stay on till the end to listen to all the wonderful talks. And uh, I'm, I was given this interesting topic to speak on on uh, painless cataract surgery. And frankly. Uh, while we keep speaking of topical surgery and everything, uh, I thought this was a nice concept. Uh, so I, I you know, enjoyed uh, preparing a little bit for this uh, talk as well, a little different from my topical anesthesia surgeries. And yes, we've come a long way. I was just thinking back to uh, what we used to do uh, way back uh, in the ECC days when, you know, patients would be literally, you know, jumping and squealing when we made the incisions and we did the suturing and, you know, it was a painful experience, even though it was done under perivulvar and retrovulvar anesthesia 25 years back. So we've really come a long way. And uh, I think uh, today we are able to offer patients a very, very good experience uh, for their cataract surgery. And uh, it's, it's changed for, for both doctors and patients as well. So what are, you know, when we sit down and talk to a patient who's, you know, when you tell him that, oh, you have a cataract and, you know, you're going to need a surgery. The first reaction is that, you know, they kind of are taken aback that, oh, you know, and I think the first fears that they have is that surgery will be painful. There may be a painful injection. And uh, the surgery itself may be painful as well. And then post-operative precautions and restrictions that they've heard about and the discomfort. So I think our job, we end up trying to, of course, uh, reassure them. But, uh, you know, this thing has to gradually go away that cataract surgery is painful and cataract surgery can cause discomfort and everything to patients, you know. So, uh, you know, our job is to minimize the pain for uh, patients. And that involves, uh, you know, frankly, uh, my shift to topical anesthesia happened almost 10, 12 years back. And then for a while, I was back to giving peribulbers, you know, it used to give me a little bit of hypertension probably for a year or two in between. And then, you know, last seven, eight years, I've been totally on topical, in fact. And I think it has actually made uh, surgery much better and simpler and easier uh, for me and more predictable. And I think the experience for the patient. So gradually, once you're conversant, I would not say that somebody should jump into uh, topical anesthesia straight when you start cataract surgery. But once you have achieved a particular level of fluency with your FACOs and you're able to finish your surgeries in 5-10 minutes or maybe at the most 15 minutes, you know, you can start thing, making the move to a topical anesthesia. Now that requires, uh, first of all, you know, uh, when we start talking to the patient prior to surgery, when you are on your defensive, you try to tell the patient, don't worry, you are not going to have pain. It's more in our minds than in the patient's minds. So, you know, 10 years back when I started doing topical, I would tell the patient and talk to them for two minutes trying to tell them, don't worry, you know, it's not going to hurt and I will not, I will make sure that, you know, you are comfortable and all. Today, I don't even talk to them. I don't mention the fact that whether I'm going to do a topical or a peribulbar or an injection will be used at all or if it was used in the past, we don't discuss this. And frankly, I found that patients are absolutely fine. 
actually the one thing which probably to me made the biggest difference was about you know 18 years back when we started doing refractive surgery and i started doing uh, topical lasik and dr bahuja sir will agree you know that was the thing that told me that when patients can undergo a full lasik procedure with a flap and microkeratoma and everything under topical then why not cataract surgery and i remember uh, one uh, session with dr amar in agra about 20 maybe years you know when suddenly people spoke about no anesthesia cataract surgery or something i was astounded i said you know this cannot be true but see uh, what what i think we are all looking at is making making the patient comfortable a lot of it is also verbal anesthesia keep talking to the patient usually they you know kind of uh, trust you and they will you know have a much better experience now another thing which i would like to highlight and this was reiterated in a session just few days back there was an international session a webinar which i was in and i have been doing this but i would strongly like to recommend this we tend to use a pre operative nsaid more for you know intra operative mitriasis to be maintained you know and that was one thing which we learned so many years back now i went through a few studies which have said that uh, those topical patients who had been using nsaid drops for the 2 to 3 days prior to cataract surgery along with maybe your antibiotic or even without the antibiotic for that matter tend to have experience much less pain during the cataract surgery and uh, you know i was um, quite surprised actually to read this but frankly it kind of reassured me that what we are doing is absolutely fine we use 48 hours before recommendation was for 3 days so for those of you who are still not using pre operative nsaid drops i would strongly suggest that you know if you start them 3 days prior to surgery this will make your patient much more comfortable with very few instances of intra operative pain then we've moved a long way and come now to intracameral anesthetics when we started doing topicals i tried with gels and other stuff and you know different concentrations of medicines proparacaine seems to work so well but now we have access to extremely good intracameral anesthetics and combinations with mitriatics as well and i will be talking a little more about that and then of course you have to minimize the painful maneuvers during surgery and as we go through some of the videos i'll try to explain those now frankly uh, before you decide to do a patient under topical you have to be sure that you are fine and you want to keep the patient painless so if a patient is unable to tolerate the light of the slit lamp uh, on the slit lamp exam that is should be one warning that those some patients who are very photosensitive may find trouble during surgery to keep their eyes open under the microscope lights also when you do an indirect ophthalmoscopy if patient is able to fixate on the various areas which you would like them to move around with and are able to cooperate that's another sign that patient will usually do well uh, you know under topical anesthesia and then the routine you know maneuvers if if your assistant tells you that this patient was very uncooperative for the syringing part or for iop measurements you will know that this patient may be as well it's not always true but sometimes that is so if a patient is very anxious or high strung or is very very sensitive to different things you may want initially at least want to switch to a, a regional anesthesia then also i have noticed that the dense mature cataracts can sometimes they don't fixate well on the microscope light they tend to have a strong bells and you may find it tough to operate those under topical anesthesia and give them a painless experience but that's not always the case many patients can fixate nicely and then we have the in and those eyes which have had prior surgery the high myopes where there is a deep ac and where the whole lens iris diaphragm will move forward backwards uh, when the iop is raised these are the patients who will have significant discomfort during surgery and you have to be better prepared and if many things if many of these flags are coming up then you might want to switch to a injectable anesthesia as well so going on i wanted to show you something which is grotesque and you know uh, one of my old videos and uh, this this thing is something which i hate i can't even think i used to do this at one time hold a forceps on the conjunctiva and just watch i'm trying to make a side port incision and i'm holding the conjunctiva with a forceps now i today would not do this ever and uh, this is something which i strongly suggest that if we are wanting to move to a painless cataract surgery we should all be careful about not holding the conjunctiva with a forceps even if it's a plain forceps i would rather you know this would be slightly more acceptable what i just did kind of stabilize the globe with a close forceps is still acceptable but holding the conjunctiva with anything like a tooth forceps or even a plain forceps is extremely painful at that point the patient may not feel anything but definitely towards the later surgery this will all add up today i would make my uh, incision somewhat like this i try to stabilize the globe with the uh, you know a, a bud which is soaked and uh, i have already put topical uh, anesthetic uh, have good quality blades that's very very important if you don't have good quality blades again you know you will probably be forcing your way through now just watch uh, what i'm going to do i've made my two paracentesis now i'm injecting from the side port not viscoelastic but 0.1 ml of uh, lignocaine or oculan kind of a preparation today i also use phenocaine plus and i'll talk about it but not in this case now i've just injected 0.1 here now this is good enough for tightening the chamber and as well as giving that patient a small dose of uh, intracameral anesthetic 
And while it's not necessary to use in every patient, but I've realized that if I do use this 0.1 ml, all our patients are happy. Now, this is not a good blade. So you can see that I wanted to again highlight that how your plate, uh, you know, can give you a sudden entry, can cause pain to the patient, you can cause pressure. So, but stabilizing the globe with the cotton bud is something which would be really useful. And uh, going on now, Iris, second most important thing in my mind is that your surgery should have least amount of uh, iris, uh, you know, manipulations. Here you can see that I'm trying to highlight that if you're getting an iris prolapse, please don't continue to use it. It will cause meiosis and it will cause discomfort to the patient. And then if you do have a iris prolapse like this, don't try to push it back with an instrument. Just do hydro, uh, you know, reposition. Just see, I'm just pushing fluid and I was able to push that iris back. All I did was just watch here. I'm just pushing a gush of fluid from a 5cc syringe and you know it just goes back nicely it happens even with the side ports and the main port i don't use instruments to touch the iris as far as possible now another situation here where you know we had to do a stretch of the pupil so that can be painful now of course injecting trypan blue under the small pupil sometimes can be done but all the manipulations cause you know iris irritation iris trauma and you can see that here i'm planning to while i put intracameral uh, you know i do all these small pupil patients also today under uh, topical anesthesia but yes you know if you are not comfortable and you're expecting a prolonged surgery now these maneuvers are all painful and can cause pain not that you cannot do them i typically do them now but for somebody who is starting out i would strongly suggest that such patients should be taken up with uh, you know, uh, a, a, a injectable anesthesia, if you can, to keep the experience painless. Our job is not to win the war of being topical in 100% cases. Our job is to make the surgery very comfortable for the patient and for the surgeon. Sometimes if you have to give an injectable anesthesia, one should not hesitate to do that. Now, bottle height is another thing which can be a big factor in a painless experience for the patient. And uh, while, you know, when we started off, we started with fish pumps and we started with raising the bottle to the ceiling. I remember the early days in the late 90s and the early 2000s when we were operating, we were always, our machines were not great. You know, the fluidics were not as good and we would get, uh, you know, surge and we would have uh, fluctuations in the chamber and all these things necessitated a very good bottle height. Today, things have changed tremendously and I don't think a, a very high bottle height is good. Uh, if you can manage one of the newer machines, which all have good fluidics. So high IOP can cause, uh, you know, glaucoma compromise, eyes can be bad, endothelial trauma with high fluent turbulence. You know, you can have a floppy iris, which will in, 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 uh, translate into patient being uncomfortable and pupil becoming smaller. You will have very deep chambers and, you know, the lens can fall back a lot. And you can, in high myopes, you will have more, more difficulty with surgery. Also in topical FACO, these patients tend to have more pain and the high myopes, a posterior shift of the lens diaphragm, as I mentioned, and if you have compromised on you. So many reasons why you should probably be switching to, if possible, on your machines. You can keep trying. Now, again, as I said, many times the block is in our mind. We think that we cannot operate at lower bottle heights, but given the right settings, many machines today can work on much lower heights than what you are used to. So a low IOP and a low infusion pressure can be very, very useful. And uh, a physiological IOP is of uh, very, very good importance. And of course, it's endothelial friendly and it's also comfortable for patients under topical anesthesia. Much less turbulence, much less iris irritation Small in small pupils and floppy iris. It's also optic nerve friendly, I would say. And then, of course, if you have a PC defect or a PC rent, you have to immediately think that you need more controlled and stable IOP and a lower IOP at that belt so that there is no turbulence. And then, of course, in challenging situations. So let's see. Uh, this is a low IOP surgery where I'm uh, showing a... Let me switch off the music, please. Okay. In fact, this is captured from one of the live surgeries for the AIOS, which uh, we were having a live transmission. And here, if this was a patient with pseudo exfoliation with a very shallow chamber. And uh, again, here we are planning to operate with an IOP of uh, just about 25 and a bottle height, which is just 39. So, all I'm trying to show you is that you know you can go ahead, not iris manipulation should be minimized. So, you know, you might want to use iris hooks or a uh, ring, and then, you know, it may be a good idea to put uh, injectable anesthesia. I personally still use all these devices with topical anesthesia. So minimum movement of the globe around, minimum handling, you don't need to touch the globe, you don't need to touch the conjunctiva if the patient is fixating, you know, have minimum amount of manipulations inside the eye. And then, you know, uh, you can go through with a comfortable surgery here. You can see that the IOP remains quite low. This is a fairly hard cataract. And in spite of that, we have a very, very stable chamber. Your incisions have to be perfect. If you have leaky incisions or you have very tight incisions, again, that can cause a problem. In fact, today I've changed my incision for the side port 
to one which I'm not making with an MVR off late. And if I need a really graded incision, I will use a calibrated instrument to a special needle, which will give me a calibrated incision that minimizes the amount of uh, fluid loss from the chamber and uh, stability is even better. And of course, your main incision should be calibrated to the instruments that you're using, which neither tight nor soft. And uh, once you're through with that, at low IOPs, you can practically do almost all maneuvers, including FACO and uh, in, you know the in irrigation aspiration and even all the steps. And I actually implant the lens uh, also under fluid. I don't use viscoelastic. So even some people have told me that they find it very tough to implant lenses with low IOP on the infusion. I actually end up doing that, uh, but you can increase the infusion at the time when you're wanting to inject your lens and then it's just uh, tightening the chamber there. Seeing another small clip where a hard brown cataract was being operated, again against low IOP, and here our bottle light is just about 40. Let me take you. I, I love using this Rexis marker. It's such a small tool, and while it's not relevant to the talk today, just see that I've put uh, a mark and in patients with no glow. Uh, with a white cataract, you might think that the Rexus marker will not show up, but one drop of uh, trip and glue on the eye surface, just watch there, and then it'll still show up because you know you have stained that small mark on the Rexus, and Epsilon makes this for me, and it's very nice and you know it's useful. So coming back to today's talk, we've done an intumescent cataract, we've done a decompression of the intralenticular pressure, and then gone ahead with a very hard brown cataract again, operating at low IOP, and usually your maneuvers can be all done. So this gives patient a lot of comfort, especially if patient is a high myope. This is another hard brown raw hard cataract. So idea is that you could do all grades of cataract and still maintain a low IOP. You don't have to put the bottle to the top of the ceiling or use very high fluidics and these cataracts can all be operated. Now this was actually a very challenging case and relevant to today's talk. As we started uh, with the procedure, it was, you can see that it's a very, very hard, leathery hard cataract. And the, you can see that the iris is already beginning to play up. It's a floppy iris and uh, the pupil is coming down. And as I'm trying to create a, you know, posterior plate cleavage, uh, trying to do lateral separation. And uh, here we are working on an IOP of about 60. And uh, you can see that I'm trying to crack this very, very hard uh, nut to crack and uh, the pupil already is coming down. Now, these are the things which will probably cause pain. You can see a little bit of iris is beginning to go into that side port. So the importance of having a calibrated side port where iris prolapse will not happen. Now here I've used phenocaine and you saw me inject that phenocaine. These are the ideal cases where phenocaine will work wonders for you. Not only will it give pain control to the patient, but it also helps you get some mitriasis, which you know, lasting for about uh, five, 10 minutes will give you room to complete your surgery. And uh, it works extremely well. And Phenocane Plus is, I think, now commercially available for the last one month. I've done the trials for them and I have no financial interest. But uh, over three years, we did the trials. And uh, on a variety of cases, we found that it worked extremely well. And here you can see that while we did not get a huge pupil, and it will not work in 100% of cases, but it works in at least 80 to 90% of, of our cases extremely well. And uh, yet the patient becomes comfortable as well. And we were able to complete the surgery. Now it was not, the story was not over here. We had uh, managed to get the lens out, but the bag was literally ready to jump out. It was kind of touching the endothelium and it was a very, very floppy thing. And at many points, I thought that the bag has come along with the cortex. You can see here how sticky the cortex is. And at many points I felt that uh, the, uh, you know, the bag was going to come along with the uh, cortex that was stuck there. Patient was a little uncooperative, was moving around, was an elderly patient. Now, again, you have to go very slowly. Uh, again, never touch the iris where you can, especially at these points when you're trying to get the cortex out from under the small pupil. Uh, you may tend to catch the iris into the port of your uh, aspiration cannula. Be very, very careful. Sometimes it makes good sense to just move the iris aside with your uh, infusion port and then gently uh, catch the iris and pull it in because the infusion port is definitely less traumatic than holding the iris with your aspiration port. And that can cause a wince of pain to the patient. Now, again, here we've, we are using a bimanual technique. I'm trying to stabilize the cortex with my left hand and aspirate it with the right port. Again, creating space with viscoelastic and trying to see where it is. I was for one moment scared that I'd caught, caused a PC rent. And at this point, I decided to use a, a endocapsular ring, which you know is always something which you should have kept ready. And once we've managed to do this, then aspiration of the cortex becomes a little easier and more controlled because the bag is now distended. And then of course you can go with the hydro implantation of the lens you can see here. Now this is another painful step for the patient. When you inject the lens in a topical surgery where surgery has gone on for five, 10 minutes, 
you might want to be very very careful with uh, injecting the lens i sometimes put 1.1 ml of uh, you know uh, local lignocaine injection uh, or oculan kind of a thing right into the main incision before i inject the lens so that usually makes the patients comfortable coming on to a small second part i think uh, the pros and cons of topical mydriatic drops we all know that uh, gradual onset of mydriasis limited bioavailability then multiple doses of eye drops uh, you know you have, you are using tropicacil plus or whatever whichever brand you like to use and the nsa and so many things and topical an antibiotic as well can cause superficial keratopathy and inconsistent mydriasis and sometimes intraoperative meiosis in challenging cases can be a big problem as we also know that uh, there will be systemic absorption and potential allergies so it makes sense and we've started using a lot of uh, you know patients where we use only intracameral mydriatics and uh, combination like the phenocane plus which i was talking about gives you very prompt onset of pupil dilation with a very stable mydriasis lasting about 10 to 15 minutes and can be repeated if you want with good effect gives a very good anesthesia as well and can be supplemented with less risk of systemic exposure some of the studies so i won't go into the details this was one patient which i remember where this patient was allergic to every possible thing that we might want to use from topical antibiotics to any of the mydriatic agents in fact anything for was postponed two or three times in the ot because whatever we would use would cause allergy finally we decided that we are not putting anything at all and we didn't even use preoperative antibiotics kept the eye quiet and we had the surgery with uh, zero preoperative Uh, medication and uh, were able to only intracameral phenocaine was used here and you can see that the onset of mydriasis is pretty quick now you won't get like a 8 or 9 mm pupil but you will get something good enough more than 6 mm which will work well for you and it's pretty quick in onset and it does last you through the surgery and towards the end if you want to put it somewhere during the al insertion you want to put it one more time as a 0.1 ml it works really well it's a combination of tropicamide phenylephrine and lignocaine and has been very safe we've now got about uh, 7 or 800 cases through uh, on phenocaine plus over the last 2 3 years and uh, we found that it's been endothelial friendly we've done studies on specular as well but we do tend to use only what what amount is necessary and you can see that till the end of surgery we had a good size pupil similarly another patient where we got stuck somewhere in the middle and i won't show you the whole thing but a black brown cataract where we started off with the surgery and uh, uh we thought that we would have an enough pupil size to complete the surgery but somewhere in the middle we got stuck because the pupil started coming out you can see it's a very very hard cataract and at some point i realized that once i cracked the nucleus i was going to get stuck because the iris would come into my port now that's one thing which you must totally avoid catching the iris on to your phaco probe or touching the iris with your phaco probe so here we inject uh, you know phenocaine plus and you'll probably see a quick uh, response there we have a fairly better size pupil it works well in floppy iris as well and i've used it in quite a few patients with floppy iris and uh, has done well but it will not work in 100% of your patients so this was one surgery and a last surgery after which i'll finish a uh, femto assisted surgery where we again got intraoperative my myosis now i used to use the lens 5 6 years back and i would frequently see intraoperative uh, myosis and uh, i see it little less with the catalyst and today i can do many more cases but uh, you can see here that uh, the pupil became small when we started the surgery and we have used uh, as, at this point you can see that the pupil had become pretty small we have injected intracameral uh, you know cane plus and we have a fairly decent sized pupil there so i think you know many of these things fluctuations in the chamber and all the other points that i spoke about are so so important when you want to give a patient a painless experience now trying to come to the end this is what phenocaine plus again i have no financial interest but uh, i think injecting the iol is my last slide where you can see that i'm doing a hydro implantation i have sometimes put if a patient has uh, started feeling sensitive towards the end of surgery i'll put a 0.1 ml into the main port of the incision before i inject and this is another patient where sometimes it can be a painful experience if the lens gets stuck in the tunnel now that happened in this patient so the, those patients you have to be extremely careful you can supplement some kind of topical anesthesia if this happens to you because the stretch of the lens on the incision is tremendous and can cause problems so i think uh, these are few of the points i will skip this last slide i'll give you the take home message i think uh, so starting you have to plan for it you can't just jump into surgery thinking that you're going to you know go ahead with it my 90% of the times it will work but sometimes it will not so pre operative assessment and counseling of the patient and giving him that comfort talk uh, that you know everything is going to be smooth and you don't need to worry and there is no pain in cataract surgery 90% of the times avoid holding the conjunctiva uh, use the right speculum that's again something which is extremely important the stretch of the speculum 
use, I, I don't hesitate today to use intracameral anesthetic in every patient. It, it keeps patients very happy and comfortable and uh, we are not getting any points for not using it. Minimize fluctuations in the chamber, uh, avoid touching the iris and uh, avoid stretching the back. Sometimes when you're chopping a very hard cataract and you stretch the back, you might want, you might cause some discomfort to the patient. Maintaining a low IOP is very, very good for a high myopes and in fact, for almost all patients. And IL insertion can be done in a very atraumatic way and without touching the iris, without handling the instruments, you know, causing much trauma to the conjunctiva or the incision. Even sometimes I've seen people hold the lip of the wound with a forceps trying to insert the tip of the cartridge or some of the instruments. I would avoid that completely. At the end of surgery, I like to give an intracameral antibiotic last five years. We've been using moxifloxacin and now we have good pre-filled syringes available. So it's, it works very well for us. Avoid all kinds of some conjunctival injections. I think I'll stop. I have any questions. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lutra, for a very, very elaborate uh, uh, talk. <clears throat> uh, few questions that they have come up. Uh, I think I, I mean, everyone will agree this today is an uh, era of an topical anesthesia and then some probably an added intracameral addition to that. Uh, there's an, one question which has come that do you feel that uh, the first eye will have an, I mean, second eye will have an, a more pain than the first eye? <laughs> In fact, uh, that's a very nice question, sir, because invariably the patients always end up telling you for the second eye. You know, there have been so many times when uh, patients first eye was done under uh, injectable anesthesia and the second time we've done a topical. And patient has been comfortable during surgery, but in the end, they end up telling you that talks of bar to pata nahi chala tha. And, you know, even if you've done both eyes at a gap of sometimes one month and done both extremely well, and you thought that you did a better job with the second one, you'll never get that reward from the patient. He'll always tell you. So, yes, uh, but, but if a patient has had a first experience where he says that he had a very difficult time, was very painful and all that, I will be extremely careful in those patients. Some of them are more sensitive to pain and I will go the extra mile to ensure that that patient remains comfortable. And if, if the situation demands, I would even switch to a, a peribulbar anesthesia. Although today uh, I rarely use it. Uh, do you prefer to give an anxiolytics before, before surgery? Uh, uh, I'm sorry. Are you, an, anxiolytics, do you give an anxiolytics so the patient not before for surgery? Pain as much, not for pain as much, but you know, to ensure that uh, they don't get canceled because of hypertension, anxiety induced hypertension, we do give a 0.25 um, alprazolam to all our patients uh, two hours prior to surgery. And uh, that has kept, uh, you know, our, um, our hypertensives uh, more comfortable. But I don't think it has a big role uh, for the surgery itself. Sir. I mean, okay. the uh, there are some studies uh, or some publications which has come that when you use an uh, intracameral uh, lignocan, there is some patients, they, they feel an amaurosis, and maybe for a short period of time, maybe about, you know, four to six hours. Do you feel any of your patient has uh, experienced that or it's a... Uh, it's just still in the publications. I haven't seen it. It might be to do with, but it's entirely possible. And it would be to do with uh, the lignocaine finding its way into the posterior segment and the quantity that has been used. And maybe, you know, if you went and injected it very close to the zonule somewhere and some of it went there, I'm sure it can cause that. Uh, but uh, I typically, you know, inject it just inside the incision and I inject just about 0.1 ml. I, I, I've never overused uh, these things and they, have kept me safe, but I haven't seen it. And in, in many years of doing topical anesthesia surgery, I've not seen that. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> there are two things that are very, very important that probably you you didn't put in your uh, take home messages. One was that is in a blade. <clears throat> blades is very, very important when you do that. Always use on a sharp blades where you don't have to really give a pressure uh, pressure when you're going to do that. I mean, sometimes even you don't have to really put in a bud over there to give in a pressure. And second thing, what you talked about that is an, is an a guarded, uh, guarded needle, like, you know, suppose you want to use on a 23 cannula, I mean, 23 aspirating cannula. So you want to make an incision within a 23 needle, probably, I think, will you just elaborate for the general public that how you do that? Sure, sure. So what I typically do is I will use a chopper, which has a bore, which is, you know, matching the 23 gauge needle. And I will use a 23 gauge needle to uh, make my side port for the chopper, you know, and the other one, which is for my bimanual irrigation aspiration, I will probably still make it as the same 20 gauge or a 23 gauge, depending on what size of instrument I'm using. So because the bimanual uh, IA instruments are made to the size, you know, which are perfect and they will go in from a size, but you know, your chopper 
kind of tapers in the end and becomes wider at the rear part so if you are using a chopper which is giving you uh, you know calibration which is similar to the needle that you're using so you'll have to work on it it won't happen yes. automatically yes you yeah. have to get a chopper and know what what size you know it is going to be once more than like say about 8 7 or 8 mm of it is inside the eye and then by experience you can check whether the wound oh. leaks when your uh, you know chopper goes in so you can find the right size of the needle to match with it it could be a 23 it could be a 24 and it could be a 22 and then make sure that your wound does not leak and uh, i wish there was a better way to do it and i'm i'm kind of thinking on these lines of trying to find a way of how we can really calibrate our instruments to the side port just like the uh, you know vitrectomy instruments are all calibrated to go in through your thing without any leak so i mean for now we have to manage by just yeah. calibrating your needle to that yeah that's right i mean that's an reason for the general public i wanted because most of the people they don't understand that what an instrument you are putting because most of the times you use the the oh. chopper like you know so in that the the front end when you're going to go that it's very small and when you go that about 4 4 1/2 5, 5, 5 mm inside and at that time that you have to calibrate the the size of the size of the chopper that uh, you want to go into that absolutely very well if there's an any question that probably will just take it at the end as you are going to be there till the end of the <laughs> yeah thank you very much thank you thank you sir thank you so much and enjoyed uh, giving this thank talk thank you thank you dear gorav dr kishore sir Thank and you. Uh, <clears throat> we now move on to the next section section that is the retina section and uh, we have with us dr dev dulal chakraborty all the way from calcutta and we have our own gaurav shah from boa so both of them sapnesh can you unmute both of yes. them so they can dr dev yes yeah, yeah yeah i Uh, hello, hello. Now, uh, good morning, the, everybody. The fortunate uh, coincidence is that both Dr. Dev Dulal and Dr. Gaurav Shah have had the. Is he there? Has he? Yeah. Dr. Dev Dulal Chakravarti is a senior consultant at Disha Eye Hospital, Kolkata. Uh, he has done his fellowship from Shankar Netrale, Chennai. he's also done his advanced training in retinopathy of prematurity from orbis uh, he has done his international observership at bascom palmer eye institute in miami florida he has to his credit numerous peer reviewed publications and awards so welcome dr dev dulal it's a pleasure to have you uh, and he is going to speak on the enigma of similarity does randomized control trial translate into real world practice and to moderate this session we have dr gaurav shah hi dr gaurav nice to have you sunday morning hey. sorry we are we are, we are in the same attire black t-shirts so gaurav is a, a, pro, a prolific a very reputable retina and uva specialist he is a, a consultant senior consultant at i life clinic khar and netra mandir borivli he has done his post graduation from sn his fellowship from lvpi hyderabad and his advanced training from the university of florida he has been a visiting assistant professor of the university of florida for almost a decade now and his special interests are vascular retinopathy retinal detachment endophthalmitis uveitis and complications of cataract surgery so the floor is to handed to you now dr dev dulal you can start uh, you know sharing your screen yeah thank you pritham sir and thanks boa for this kind opportunity i hope i am audible Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Loud and clear. Go ahead. The screen is visible. Thanks. So uh, I'll be speaking on the enigma of similarity. Does randomized control trials translate into real world practice? So many of our neovascular AMD patients until 2006 had only progressive vision loss to look forward to, and there was a lot of anxiety, confusion. fear and shock in these patients so until 2006 or the first part of the century when actually we started you know getting yeah. those uh, anti vgf molecules and it was in the year 2006 when we all know that ranibizumab was approved for usage in neovascular amd now if you look at the evolution of ranibizumab uh, from then on it has received of course approval for dme for rvos and of course myopic cnvms and retinopathy of prematurity recently but something interesting happened in india in the year 2015 when the approval for the biosimilar ranibizumab came through so when it comes to retinal therapy and treatment options today we have you know options to uh, you know 
provide uh, to patients with neovascular AMD or maybe myopic CNVMs and diabetic macular edema and retinal vein occlusions. And a lot of this is dependent on anti-VEGFs. Of course, the steroids and lasers have their role to play and VR surgery in certain situations are of course necessary. Now, what actually has changed across the world since then is that there has been a 46 to 72% reduction in blindness caused by various retinal diseases. A lot of this, of course, has been because of the consistent 12-month visual acuity gains that the innovator Ranibizumab has been able to provide in the treatment of retinal diseases, be it neovascular AMD or diabetic macular edema or uh, the retinal vein occlusions and myopic CNVMs. And what's even better is that you can actually, uh, you know, continue to maintain these, uh, uh, you know, patients on good vision for a longer period of time if the patient, of course, is compliant. However, when it comes to real world studies and real world data, things are slightly different as opposed to randomized clinical trials, which are interventional and comparative data. They have specific well-defined patient inclusion criteria with uh, you know, good uh, patient adherence, uh, almost uh, uh, a foregone conclusion and compliance of foregone conclusion in these randomized clinical trials. Uh, you, of course, assess the efficacy, the postology, and safety in the patient cohort. In coming to the real world, these are usually open label representative of a broader patient population. And patients, of course, have variable patient adherence and uh, compliance. Uh, this is a real big issue in the real world. And of course, uh, when it comes to uh, evaluating uh, any particular molecule, uh, you can, of course, assess the performance in routine clinical practice. Now, when we talk about comparing different NTVEGFs in neovascular AMD in the real world, probably the largest data set comes from the IRIS registry, where three NTVEGF agents were compared head to head in neovascular AMD over one year in the US clinical practice. And what we see here is a lot of injections, uh, but something that's very interesting is at the end of one year, all of these practically needed a very similar number of injections. And when it comes to uh, improvement of visual equity with ranibizumab and aflibercept, we see that the visual equity performance or improvement was pretty much similar. And of course, with bevacizumab, the improvement uh, was slightly lesser. What about comparing with biosimilars? Well, we of course have the, had the re -NX study, which was retrospective multicenter observational study on RET AMD. But if you look uh, into it a little you know, deeper, it was uh, for a period of three months only. And it was a non-inferiority study, meaning that uh, they looked into a percentage of patients with less, less than uh, you know, 15 letters loss of vision. And of course, the study had only 100 patients, 75 in the biosimilar arm and uh, 25 in the innovator uh, arm. So we did this actually, uh, this study across 15 branches of Dichai hospitals, uh, uh, of which five were urban branches and 10 were rural branches. Just to uh, you know, go into a little bit of a background, uh, why we started using biosimilars was because in 2014-15, we had uh, you know, our issues with bevacizumab. We had a cluster in ophthalmitis and we actually had to stop uh, using uh, bevacizumab uh, from then on because of you know, public pressure and you know, media reports and everything. So uh, we actually were looking for something uh, uh, you know, that was relatively inexpensive as compared to the innovator molecule available at that point of time. And uh, we uh, actually uh, started using uh, the biosimilar ranibizumab uh, after the DCGI gave permission. So uh, this was uh, actually uh, a non-randomized retrospective open label multicenter phase four study of 903 eyes, where we actually evaluated patients of visual impairment due to wet AMD across multiple centers. 17 ophthalmologists were involved in this and uh, the innovator ranibizumab group had 726 eyes and the biosimilar group had 177 eyes. And the primary objective was to evaluate the change in visual equity with the innovator ranibizumab and the biosimilar ranibizumab in the neovascular AMD patients. If you look at the inclusion criteria, the patients with uh, treatment knife in neovascular AMD were taken up and uh, both eyes could be included as a separate case. At least six months of follow-up was necessary. And uh, regarding exclusion criteria, criteria, we actually uh, you know, left out any patient who switched drugs and uh, of course, any other uh, you know, poor existing retinal disease such as VRV or et cetera were left out. And of course, if the patient uh, underwent any kind of ocular surgery uh, during the course of the you know, study, they were left out. So besides the primary endpoint of the change in best corrected visual equity between baseline and final follow-up, we looked into the secondary endpoint of the number of intravitreal injections that the patient received. 
So moving on to the results uh, for uh, patients who had 636 or better visual acuity on the Snellens chart, uh, converting to Logmar, the innovator group had 0.201 Logmar units of improvement of vision and the biosimilar group had 0 0.078 logma units of improvement of vision. So you see uh, there's a statistically significant difference between the two agents here, and it was in favor of the innovator molecule here. And if you uh, looked into patients who had lesser vi visual acuity, that is less than 636, the innovator group had a 0 0.304 logma units of improvement, that is 636 being converted into uh, logmar and the biosimilar group had 0.133 logmar units of improvement. So again, uh, this was statistically in favor of the innovator molecule here. What about patients, uh, you know, improving by number of lines? Well, uh, considering a baseline vision of 624, patients who improved three or more lines were 48% for the innovator molecule and 29% for the biosimilar molecule. Regarding uh, adherence to index treatment, that is continuing with the same anti-VEGF for a period of more than six months, it was 23% for the innovator ranibizumab molecule. And for the biosimilar molecule, it was 6.8%. So we see a threefold difference between the two, you know, here uh, uh, regarding the adherence part of it. And if you talk about the mean number of injections, the mean number of injections was 2.1 for the innovator group and 1.56 for the uh, biosimilar group. Regarding uh, patients who actually you know, took the loading dose and went down to have uh, three or more injections, it was actually 29% for uh, the innovator molecules and uh, for the biosimilar group, it was 16% of the patients who actually had three or, more molecule, uh, three or more injections. Like all retrospective studies, our study also had its limitations uh, due to pre-specified criteria. Data from only a subset of eyes could be included. A potential limitation of this real world study is that we could only consider information that was available in the structured EMR. Visual equity data was recorded in Snellens and run, then transferred to Logmar. And due to the real world nature of this study, it was mostly a PR and regimen that was used. Our attrition rates are uh, were, however, similar when compared to other cohorts uh, of uh, RWE studies that have been published in literature with reported losses between 55 and 89%. So we actually wondered what were the reasons for better adherence? Uh, was it because of, you know, from the patient's perspective, better visual acuity outcome that the patient could actually uh, appreciate or whether it was better safety and tolerability, whether patient counseling had a role to play. And from the physician's perspective, whether we were actually giving a treatment assurance for uh, the uh, proven track record of the, you know, innovator molecule. So these were things that we tried to, you know, consider. So in a nutshell, uh, regarding the results, the evidence from the randomized clinical trials do not fully match with the real world data in the uh, fact that improvement of visual equity in the Indian context may be slightly more than what we have seen in the West. And of course, innovator ranibizumab has demonstrated high efficacy and uh, drug cost, uh, what we found was uh, not the only factor that actually you know, led to better compliance of the uh, uh, treatment. So I'd like to acknowledge uh, the entire team, uh, Retina at Dishai Hospitals, and thank you for your kind attention. Thank uh, you for the wonderful presentation. Thank you. Uh, question first, I think, uh, from the audience. Uh, Dr. Sunil Morekar uh, wants to know what mechanism was used to account for the confounding factors which were inherent in your study. Yeah, actually, uh, uh, we uh, uh, a few things that I need to mention here is, uh, are, you know, we offer a bouquet of uh, anti, anti VEGF to everybody who comes for, you know, uh, maybe uh, AMD or DME or for that matter, uh, the other diseases as well. Uh, having said that, you know, in AMD, we obviously, we actually, we left aside people who were offered, uh, you know, Com combination therapy with PDT or maybe afibercept patients uh, who actually were uh, advised afibercept patients of IPCV. So those were left aside. So this was uh, specifically patients who actually, you know, were offered uh, a bouquet choice of an, uh, anti vegf and they we looked into data uh, regarding the ranibizumab, uh, innovator ranibizumab, and the biosimilar ranibizumab. So uh, and uh, patients had to have at least six months of follow up that was available with us. And, uh, you know, uh, the patients obviously uh, should not have had any other uh, coexisting retinal disease or, uh, you know, or surgery in between. So these are, uh, these are the, uh, you know, same set of criteria that we looked into for both these groups. Yeah. If, uh, as I understand, this was a retrospective study. Yeah. And it showcases how many patients you all have in actual life given the injections. Yeah. 
uh, and considering that let's say there is no bias uh, in uh, advising the injection yeah how can you account that the innovator molecule was given in around 700 and uh, some odd eyes versus only around 170 eyes the uh, biosimilar was given so is there some bias what i'm trying to hint at is there some bias inherent in the system somewhere otherwise in general in real world scenario we really see that uh, because of the cost difference if there is no counseling bias then the amount of uh, biosimilar uh, molecule being taken up by the patient is much larger so can you just expand on that part yeah actually uh, this has been our uh, you know uh, observation also uh, starting from 2015 uh, december 2015 onwards we've so far used uh, 9500 uh, you know or uh, until last year that is december 2019 i'm giving figures uh, we've used 9500 injections of biosimilars across various indications and uh, of course in between you know biosimilars were not available for a period of time that could have you know affected the numbers the other uh, significant thing that i should mention here is that we looked into actually the uh, patients number of patients who actually you know took uh, anti vegf uh, injections uh, following an advice of a uh, anti vegf injection across the board the numbers are 52% patients only actually could afford anti vegf injections uh, uh, you know uh, a- a- any of them in disha and 48% of the patients could not afford injections so whether it was a you know it was uh, something to do with uh, the cost part of it or whether it had something to do with uh, patients not being able to afford uh, something that was uh, 30% lower than uh, you know uh, the innovator molecule that also is a big question that we are trying to look into uh, because uh, when we were using bevacizumab uh, way back in 2013 14 we were giving around 12000 plus injections a year but now La- even you know in 2019 these numbers actually have uh, you know uh, uh, are at you know 10000 plus levels so we actually came down to 6500 injections the year we stopped uh, giving uh, uh, you know bevacizumab from you know 12000 so it came down to uh, half of uh, what we were injecting and in all these years we've actually moved up to you know around uh, uh, 10000 injections so you have half of the patients actually you know not being able to afford injections so it is uh, this is something that's very important so that is uh, why i i think you know uh, many people who cannot afford uh, uh, the innovator molecule also cannot afford the biosimilar molecule so that therein lies the fact that you know you have this data of 170 odd people Uh, of course the numbers are slightly more because of the exclusion criteria we had to leave uh, a lot of people aside uh, but uh, you know having said that uh, this is an important uh, reason why you know so many patients uh, you know could not take anti vegf injections so that therein lies the reason why you have this discrepancy so maybe the better of people could take uh, anti vegf molecules uh, whereas the you know poorer section of the society who also come to disha various branches especially the rural branches uh are the you know the uh, advice intervention ratio is, is skewed another question from uh, dr sunil morekar was the same innovator superiority seen by other real world evidence from other groups uh, uh well there are hardly any uh, real world evidences uh, regarding the biosimilar and uh, the uh you know the innovator uh, uh, barring the rnx study so the rnx study is there for all of us to see Uh, that was of course a non inferiority study and uh, uh, there's no question regarding whether biosimilar works or not uh, this is what we found you know in our retrospective analysis and uh, part of it has also been published and the other part is under review for publication so uh, you know i i don't think there are very many studies uh, regarding the biosimilars so let's talk about real world yeah. scenario uh, dr debdunal in your yeah. experience why do you think that you found a difference between the two groups you see it day to day in your uh, patient profile mm, uh, are you talking about the visual acuity performance or uh, the adherence uh, gorov the visual acuity performance yeah uh, so i think uh, uh, like uh, uh, of course these are ranibizumab molecules but having said that uh, these are not exactly the similar molecule so you have uh, if if you uh, if you uh, you know look into the composition part of it every 
you know biologic has its own proprietary uh, issues and you know um, uh, chemical uh, composition is slightly different from what the biosimilar is so that might be a cause of the difference in the visual equity part of it so going forward if you find that there is a difference do you find this difference is only at a statistical level or is it really clinically significant uh well uh, i i uh, would uh, rather you know put it like this uh, that when a patient comes to uh, me or for you uh, or to you for treatment and uh, patient chooses a particular drug and if the patient has a certain amount of improvement of vision uh, whatever like for whatever uh, you know uh, disease so i think uh, you know it's for the patient to decide whether uh, the the uh, the improvement is acceptable to him or not him or her or not so if the pa patient feels that the you know visual equity improvement is is acceptable to him or her then i think the patient continues with the treatment as opposed to if the patient doesn't really uh, you know uh, think that it's it's doing good to him or her then the patient obviously thinks about you know certain other options yeah but uh, again in uh, this retrospective study as i understand these were all uh, treatment name patients so yeah. these were people yeah. who were receiving the injection for the first time right and i think at least in my experience a lot of time what drug the patient chooses depends only on two factors number one is the cost of the drug and number 2 is the counseling how yeah. have we been able to counsel so yeah. what we are projecting so right. let's say you have a patient tomorrow in your uh, opd who has yeah. a fresh amd and you have to counsel him right. so which way would you go ahead and counsel him with respect to these two drugs right so uh, uh, considering that the patient uh, does not have ipcv or any other confounding factors which uh, we generally you know try to exclude so uh, uh, what we actually tell the patient and this is as a uh, rule this is the protocol in disha we we uh, tell the patients uh, these are the options uh, of anti vegfs available and uh, we are comfort comfortable with whatever you are comfortable so that's that's uh, you know the uh, way we uh, go forward with these patients and it's then the patients uh, you know then the next question comes from the patient maybe the patient will ask uh, you know some leading questions uh, regarding which drug to use or you know what is your opinion and uh, what is the data and also therein you know comes uh, some of the people who are uh, you know google savvy uh, or internet savvy they they come in with uh, their kind of thoughts also so there are a lot of people in fact maybe 20 25% of the people who come in actually they uh, know what they have come in with especially you know the uh, you know better off people so they also have a role to play in choosing the drug thanks a lot uh, i think i would request pritam or swapnesh yeah. both who are co-host and host and are well known retina surgeons from mumbai to chip in about their experience of uh, the biosimilar versus the innovator molecule i don't know i i am <clears throat> personally i am pretty ha happy with the biosimilars also but uh, of course the, the like dr dev lulal said the molecules don't match each other in absolute composition so you know at the tissue level where they act there must be definitely some difference and you know as the real world world experience increases i'm sure we will understand the difference and you know no uh, better understand these molecules i feel uh, both of them definitely act well uh, also we have to take into account uh, the medical legal aspect where even the biosimilar which we have has been dgci approved and second is which one of them would be able to get more uh, insurance for the patient Uh, how are the tie ups and how are the insurance companies handling these two molecules will also play a important role in the future as to what is acceptable to the patient as well as the doctor uh, one query i had uh, uh, to dr dev did yeah. you find any difference in the batches which come or of late it has been very consistent but did you find that uh, is there a difference in the efficacy of the manufacturing batches which which you have used we actually we are looking into this uh, data year wise actually data we are looking into it uh, because we uh, uh, we found slight uh, difference in the visual performance you know in uh, maybe 2016 as compared to 2019 so i think you have a point there what kind yes. of difference do you see do you see it uh, the efficacy becoming better or worse uh, uh, 
uh, there is, uh, I don't know whether it is statistically significant or not, because I don't have the statistician's interpretation on that. Uh, there is a slight improvement of, uh, you know, uh, the vision in the uh, recent times. Yes, I agree I think, that uh, uh, at least, on, yeah, I think if there are no other questions, then uh, in, uh, for lack of time, we go ahead. We Thanks a lot, Dr. Uh, Dev Dulal, for uh, the extensive experience of Disha, which you have uh, brought here. Thanks My a lot. Pleasure. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much. So moving on to the next uh, section, that is a section of cornea. So we have with us again, uh, you know, two of uh, stars in their own fields, Dr. Rishi Swaroop from Hyderabad and uh, can you unmute them, Swapnish? Dr. Rishi Swaroop uh, is a director. Hi, Dr. Hi, Rishi. How are you? Hello. Hi. Dr. Rishi Swaroop is director and chief surgeon of the Swaroop Eye Center at Hyderabad. He has done his cornea fellowship from Shankar Netralai, Chennai. He has been the secretary of the Hyderabad Ophthalmic Association. He is currently the <clears throat> section editor of the cornea section for the Indian Journal of Ophthalmology. And uh, needless to say, he has multiple awards to his credit, to name a few, the Achievement Award from the Acad uh, American Academy of Ophthalmology for 2013. He also has the gold medal from the, uh, the uh, Intraocular Implant and Refractive Society of India in 2015. So welcome, Dr. Rishi. Dr. Rishi is going to speak on an important aspect of, uh, you know, corneal therapeutics, that is the corneal cross linkage and its new modification. And we also have with us Dr. Vardaman. Good morning. Welcome, Dr. Vardaman. In the recent past, I've had, uh, I've been fortunate to associate with Vardaman in Maharashtra Ophthalmic Society. We've been closely working. Thank you. Uh, can I get started? Been a dynamic secretary of MOS. Sorry, sorry. He has been the uh, he is a director of the Asian Eye Hospital in Pune. He has been an alumni of Shankar Netralay and Bascom Palmer Institute in Florida, as well as the UOC in Greece. He has to his uh, name more than forty peer-reviewed publications. His special interest, besides cataract and refractive surgery, is today's topic that is uh, collagen cross-linking. Again, he has various awards to his name, to name a few, the gold medal from the IRSI, the Bell Pharma and the FDC award, the Innov Innov Innovation Award from Maharashtra Ophthalmic Society, and uh, last year, the most prestigious award from MOS, that is a VK Chitnis Award. So welcome, Vardaman. And uh, you know now I hand over the floor to Dr. Rishi. Uh, please start your uh, presentation. Thank you, Dr. Pritam, and uh, uh, thank you to BOA for having me uh, in this webinar. It's very exciting, and the talks before me were really, very good. So without further ado, I'll get started. Um, the topic given to me was cross-linking, and um, everyone's talking about what's new, so I'm also going to touch upon some of the new developments in collagen cross-linking. So I think a lot of us are doing cross-linking, and we know that just like phaco emulsification, even cross-linking, we have kind of borrowed from the dentists. They routinely use UV light to fix their dental fillings. And similarly, we are using UV light to kind of cross-link the collagen in the cornea and make it tougher and hopefully resistant to uh, ectasia and other um, conditions. So essentially what we're doing is we are instilling riboflavin in the eye putting UV light of 365 nanometers, and then um, hoping that uh, there is a photochemical reaction which happens, which cross-links essentially the anterior half or 300 microns or so of the cornea. Now, uh, we know the indications of cross-linking are typically ectasia, uh, but um, it's important that we should be clear on what, who are the ideal candidates to have cross-linking. Uh, typically, you would go for a keratoconus, would be, uh, be a progressive keratoconus, but if you want to do it as, as a primary treatment, please ensure that it is a person who is likely to progress. For example, a young patient or a female patient who is likely to have a future pregnancy or has thyroid. Both of these have been known to be, be risk factors for progression. Uh, older patients of keratoconus can uh, also progress, and if you do have a documentation of progression, 
then you must certainly consider cross-linking in these cases. Post-LASIK ectasias can be cross-linked primarily because they are known to be aggressive uh, in progression. So once you see it, please, please cross-link immediately. Peripheral ectasias, there is, the efficacy is doubtful because the um, ectasia is not in the center. So you will not be able to cross-link it as well. And uh, literature has not shown that distinctly that it helps. Microbial keratitis is an indication, but again, the literature is uh, mixed on these. Uh, people have been using cross-linking in combination with uh, laser refractive procedures like LASIK and PRK and even SMILE, but then uh, we don't have adequate literature to show that really uh, it helps and it doesn't cause harm. Other indications like bullous keratopathy also, cross-linking has been used, but um, again, may not be uh, the most useful procedure. So when we talk about cross-linking, there are three main things which come into play. And all of these elements are very important for cross-linking to be effective. One is, of course, the ultraviolet light and riboflavin. But the third very important element, which many people don't talk about, is oxygen. For cross-linking to work, oxygen is necessary at the level of the collagen uh, for uh, the bonds to develop. So if you don't have oxygen, the cross-linking is not really going to work. And that is really the main bugbear of all the newer uh, developments in cross-linking and all the other things that people are trying. Protocols are many. The standard protocol is what uh, most of us use uh, and uh, all the baseline machines have got the op option of giving you three milliwatts, but, uh, and uh, you have to use it for about 30 minutes. We know all that, but uh, to save time and to become more effective, several other cross-linking protocols have been developed, especially the accelerated protocols in which you can increase the energy to up to 45 milliwatts per centimeter square and thereby reducing the uh, duration of exposure much significantly, but uh, it doesn't really translate exactly into an equal efficacy. And that's because of the oxygen factor. The second thing is uh, you have a lot of patients who miss out on cross-linking because their cornea is not thick enough. And so now newer protocols are available for thin corneas. I'll be touching upon those. Transepithelial cross-linking also has been tried, but uh, has limited efficacy. And of course, like I mentioned earlier, people are combining with eczema uh, to kind of also correct the irregularity to some extent. Uh, some extent uh, they are combining with intracornial ring segments. And there is some newer procedures like pulsed and customized cross-linking also, which I'll just touch upon. So how do you navigate this whole sea of protocols and make an uh, informed choice for your patient? So as we all know, the Dresden protocol was developed many years ago by Wolensack et al. We, in which they use 0.1% of isotonic riboflavin for 30 minutes with a power of three milliwatts per centimeter square. So that translated to, uh, to a fluence of 5.4. Um, this uh, Dr. Theo Seiler was one of the pioneers who developed this procedure. And uh, it's basically an epithelium off procedure. You remove the epithelium and then do this um, cross-linking as is shown in these videos. So you uh, kind of calibrate remove the epithelium, instill riboflavin, ideally for about 30 minutes, and then you irradiate for 30 minutes at three milliwatts. That's called the Dresden protocol, based on the place where it was developed. Now, there is something called the bunsen rosco law of photochemical reciprocity, which basically shows, say, states that as long as the overall fluence remains the same, you can play around with the duration and the energy that you're giving. So instead of giving three milliwatt, you can increase to nine milliwatt and reduce the duration to 10 or go to 18 milliwatts, reduce to five or 30 to three. And theoretically all should be effective, but practically what has been shown is that uh, really it doesn't tr translate into an equal effect. Three milliwatt per centimeter square for 30 minutes is the most effective, but nine milliwatt and 18 milliwatt are also fairly effective, but not as effective as. So this would be a good compromise of it in order to be effective yet to be able to save time. So uh, probably a practical scenario would be nine milliwatt for 10 minutes. 10 minutes is not a very long duration. And for adults, I think that really works well. If you're dealing with a pediatric case, of course, you might want to go for the full fluence uh, 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 resident protocol because you want it to be a more effective cross-linking 
as you know, the uh, effect of cross-linking may be short-lived in children. Also, in post-LASIK ectasias, you would probably want to go for if, uh, a uh, resident protocol standard cross-linking. Now, uh, there have been several studies which have uh, kind of shown this, and I'm not going to uh, deliberate on them much. Essentially, uh, you could also um, do a little bit of a modification of an accelerated protocol by uh, increasing the overall fluence. So instead of giving 18 milliwatts for uh, five minutes with uh, a 5.4 joules fluence, you could increase the fluence to 7.5. And that is shown to be as effective as a three milliwatt into 30. So you have to play around with the fluence to get the final uh, effect that you would get with the standard protocol. So that way you can have a good compromise of saving time as well as having equal efficacy. And this is basically what is called adapted fluence. So you play around with the fluence for the different situation to get an equal effect. So the, uh, there's also uh, been a, um, a phase where a lot of people are doing epion cross-linking or trans-epithelial cross-linking in which they used specialized riboflavin of higher concentration with some additives to which would increase the um, penetration of riboflavin into the eye. They do work, but like I told you, the problem with epithelial on cross-linking is that you can get riboflavin in, but the oxygen will not reach the stroma through an intact epithelium. And that is why it's not as effective. And several studies have shown that. And that is why it's essentially been given up to a large extent. Again, iontophoresis is another way of epithelium on cross-linking in which they use an electric current to help facilitate the passage of riboflavin through the intact epithelium. The problem with this is again the same that riboflavin will go through, but oxygen will not go through. And that's why it doesn't work as well as standard epi of cross-linking, which is uh, essentially shown in this diagram. You know, The epithelium and stroma 10x is the amount of oxygen which the um, epithelium consumes compared to the stroma. So you, nothing will reach the stroma if your epithelium is there. Now, thin cornea cross-linking has got a lot of uh, interest lately. And traditionally, we've been trying things like hypotonic riboflavin. Um, but you know the problem with hypotonic is that the effect is very short-lived. And you have to keep putting it again and again to keep the stroma swollen. So, uh, and it may, at the time when you're irradiating, if that effect is, if the corneal stroma is having a different thickness, the effect is not going to be uniform. So that's the limitation with hypotonic riboflavin. Contact lens assisted riboflavin has been shown very nicely by uh, Dr. Agarwal's group. But again, it has been shown to be less efficacious, again, because oxygen may not reach very well through the contact lens. Uh, people have tried putting tissue uh, like a, a, a smile lenticule or um, some other kind of a stromal tissue to kind of uh, make the cornea thicker. Uh, it could work, but then you're wasting the cross-linking, which is happening in the tissue. And, uh, essentially what's left in the bed may not be adequate. Uh, some people, uh, Mazot et al. have shown that you could you leave a little island of epithelium at the thinnest point and remove the epithelium from the remaining area. And that also works, but then you're not getting cross-linking effect at the area which is the most affected by the ectasia. So that kind of negates what you want to do. I think the one solution which really uh, is very promising is something called adapted fluence. Just like you could increase the fluence like I showed in the previous slide, you can also reduce the fluence and thereby by reducing the duration of UV exposure and essentially you can end up with uh, a, a deep, less deep penetration of the um, cross-linking effect. And uh, this might be a long-term solution for thin corneas. And Dr. Hafezi and his group has shown that it actually works. So uh, just what I mentioned earlier, hypotonic has been tried, but uh, problem is that it fluctuates. Contact lens assisted cross-linking um, uh, has been shown very well, but uh, the two problems, the uh, UV light may not pass very well through standard cross-linking. So you need a special contact lens, which doesn't block UV and oxygen perme permeability may not be as effective. And, Again, some studies from Hafizi's group have shown that it doesn't work as well. This is just a picture showing that little island of epithelium being left behind in the area of the thinnest uh, stroma and rest of it is removed. So the riboflavin will penetrate from the sides and you can still probably be able to do cross-linking. And this does work, but again, may not be the ideal one. 
So adapted fluence is ideal. Uh, now the exact nomogram uh, Dr. Hafezi is yet to publish, uh, but we do have uh, a nomogram developed by the Nara and Netrale group. And uh, theoretically you could actually go as thin as 220 microns, which means basically studies have shown that you need about 150 microns for cross-linking to be effective. And 70 microns is the safety zone that they have theoretically calculated. So as long as 220 is the thickness, minus the epithelium, you should be able to do cross-linking. So that gives you a lot more range. And this calculator has been developed by Nara Netrale, and it seems to be quite effective. I've been using this. And you can see you have, if you go to this website, you just enter the corneal thickness, and on the right, you can see the time that you need to give for different uh, powers, 3 milliwatt to 9 milliwatt, and different uh, fluence uh, ranges. So that way, you can still be quite effective. Uh, and um, uh, uh, essentially makes your job very easy. You just put in the punch in the number and gives you, of course, this needs to be validated with a large uh, term study. And I think they are already on it and we'll wait for that data to come out. I'm sorry, I don't know why my slide is not progressing. Okay, yeah. So uh, the other thing is uh, combining um, cross-linking with surface ablation and uh, I think two groups have essentially shown us uh, how well this works and both are from Greece. Uh, one is Canalopoulos et al, who showed us the uh, combination of topographic guided cross-linking, uh, uh, topographic guided um, surface ablation along with cross-linking. Um, essentially what one has to remember is you're not trying to correct the entire refractive error. You're trying to re regularize the cornea, to, trying to regularize the irregularities in the topography to a large extent so that the uncorrected, the best corrected vision improves and also to some extent the uncorrected visual acuity will improve. Uh, so you will undercorrect the cylinder and undercorrect the sphere. You will basically be just trying to correct the uh, irregularities. So you will do either topography guided or a wafer guided kind of an ablation to regularize the cornea. Remember that you need to leave behind about 400 microns at the end. So you won't have much scope to work with just about 50 microns of ablation uh, is what you could do. And um, basically, they also have something like a synergistic effect. Uh, the role of mitomycin C here is um, controversial. It makes sense that uh, mitomycin C would uh, probably negate the effect of the cross-linking. Um, but uh, uh, practically what has been shown is in some studies is that actually mitomycin C might increase the haze in these cases. So uh, I don't think it's really necessary, but the verdict is still out there. Some people use mitomycin, some don't. Um, I, in my practice, I've stopped using mitomycin when I'm combining ablation with uh, cross-linking. The uh, Athens protocol is such, you, you basically do a 10 milliwatt into 10 minute using 0.1 and a maximum ablation of about 50 microns. Um, so the other protocol is the Cretan protocol, which is the uh, Kimionis and group have developed in which basically they do a trans epithelial PTK rather than a PRK. So because it's a uniform ablation, if the, at the point of the bulge, you're essentially shaving the little bit of stroma and flattening the stroma in that area. So you're doing, you're actually thinning the cornea at its thinnest point a little bit, but because of that little bit of flattening, there's a significant refra refractive change which is induced. And uh, as long as it's a limited flattening of a few 15, 20 microns, it should be okay because you're also combining it to the cross-linking. So you're basically using the epithelium as a masking agent to leave behind a smoother bed. I'm getting some blue marks on my presentation. Is this an indication that I'm running out of time? No, no, I don't know, uh, sir. Please continue. I'm okay. trying to remove those an annotations. I'm trying to remove them. Okay, never mind. All right, so uh, a PRK extra, LASIK extra, SMILE extra, these are also uh, new things which have come in. Basically, these are ways of uh, treating borderline corneas. If you want to do, still want to do refractive surgery and feel good about it, you can combine a small dose of cross-linking with it. Uh, people have been doing them, but there is very little evidence to show that it really helps and it is not uh, counterproductive. So the verdict for these is still out there. Uh, and um, I don't think we I can venture into this confidently yet. 
uh, pulse light cross linking uses the prem premise that basically because oxygen is used up when you're doing cross linking you give the light in pulses and uh, studies have shown that it actually is quite effective um, and as at least as effective as continuous cross linking and the idea is that you allow time for the oxygen to come back and then you again you you use the uv light uh, exposure again so this has promised but i think we need more studies and um we'll need specialized uh, uh, cross linking machines which can give you pulse light delivery uh, customized cross linking is again something which is quite interesting and um, some of the newer machines have this option in which basically you are giving a, a kind of an adapted fluence again you are giving more fluence at the point which is most steep or most affected and then at, going at, peripherally from that you are giving a lower fluence so at the peak of your cone you're giving a higher fluence and then the fluence is gradually reducing as you go away so your radiance exposure you give it in three circles in a most circle is 10 joules per centimeter square a middle circle is 7.5 joules and the outer fluence is 5.4 the standard one so overall fluence is 9 milliwatts per centimeter square so this is how it works you give this one uh, treatment like this and then a second treatment in a larger zone and one more treatment in a larger zone and what studies have shown is that you are actually able to flatten selectively that area a little more we all know that cross linking does cause some flattening and because of this customized cross linking you are able to flatten the cone a little more to also get a refractive uh, shape stabilization with it but of course this can't work like a refractive procedure but it will definitely help re reduce irregularity and uh, there have been numerous studies showing that it does actually help sorry the slide is just getting repeated so uh, this is another uh, very interesting new indication not new but uh, interesting indication for cross linking which is microbial keratitis and which is a major problem for our country this is um, unfortunately um, most of the studies have used the standard dresden protocol so that's why the literature shows a lot of mixed results some people don't show the efficacy at all whereas some have shown the newer concept is basically to use a higher fluence so even up to 15 millijoules per centimeter square and essentially you are using say uh, 9 or 18 milliwatts for up to 30 minutes and your that kind of a dose is what is going to kill the bugs uh, it does work more for the superficial infections and may not be very effective for very deep infections uh, it certainly uh, has a role i think more studies and uh, improved protocols will make a lot of difference Uh, and if we are able to do this on the slit clamp there are new machines in which you can do cross linking on the slit clamp you will have a wider access and a lot of people may be able to do it even in the peripheral parts of the country you must remember that retreatments are possible and often necessary so higher fluence with repeat treatments may be the answer if you want to do photo activated chromophore for keratitis which is called pack cxl which is the use of Uh, CXL for microbial keratitis. Um, I think before you think of a surgical option, this may be something worth giving a try uh, with a higher fluence, of course. This is one more thing I wanted to touch upon. There are so many rib uh, riboflavin solutions in the market, especially the international market. India, of course, they have limited ones available. It gets very confusing. Uh, luckily, in India, we just have these options: the isotonic with dextran. Uh, we have isotonic with hpmc which is available but not indian brands these are some of the imported brands which are available and you have the hypotonic riboflavins which contain sodium chloride also and the um, hypotonic uh, riboflavins with which are used for epithelium on cross linking uh, for all practical purposes the isotonic with dextran is useful for our routine cases which are having significant thickness of the cornea more than 400 microns but if you are dealing with a cornea which is say 360 to 400 i would suggest choose a riboflavin which has hpmc because this does a little bit of swelling of the stroma dextran actually shrinks the stroma a little bit so hpmc is better if you can use it for all cases it's uh, probably a good idea uh, with sodium chloride can be used in conditions where you are using uh, cross linking with ablation where you don't have bowman's membrane because this essentially will immediately um, uh, affect uh, 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 swell, uh, kind of um, go into the stroma and you will have immediate uh, penetration of the riboflavin epithelial cross linking con contains a higher concentration with uh, 
tensioactive elements like BAK, which help in the um, solution passing through the epithelium quickly. So like I said, for higher packies, you can use the routine dextran with isotonic. Borderline packies go for the uh, HPMC combination. Uh, otherwise, uh, you could use the other ones. Now, what does the evidence say? This is what the evidence says. So you have lab evidence and clinical evidence. We have a good amount of lab and clinical evidence for PAC CXL, epithelium of cross-linking, accelerated up to nine milliwatts, use of cross-linking along with intracornal ring segments and uh, pulse cross-linking, accelerated protocols, I said, uh, uh, up to nine milliwatts and customized cross-linking. Uh, more than nine milliwatts and customized cross-linking have a little lesser clinical and lab evidence. But things that don't have much of uh, evidence are spheral cross-linking, LASIK extra or SMILE extra, conductive keratoplasty came and went, which is probably the worst, and cross-linking as a refractive procedure. So this is essentially a, a summary of what to believe and what not to believe. This is the final thing that I'd like to talk about. Dr. Hafezi and his group have developed this slit clamp cross-linking option. I think this is very exciting because you can develop, you can actually do cross-linking on the slit clamp just like you would do in an operation theater. And here he's showing how to remove the epithelium using 40% uh, alcohol. You can just put a speculum and just rub it with a cotton tip, tap, uh, cotton bud dipped in 40% alcohol for about 70 seconds. And then you take a mirosol sponge and then scrape off the epithelium. And then you can wash with saline on the slit lamp itself. And then you just, uh, you could uh, kind of put the uh, riboflavin solution uh, from a syringe. Maybe you can recline your uh, chair unit and put these drops uh, in your OPD it itself and then make the patient sit up again. And then you perform the cross linking. You can do all the protocols like you can with a normal machine and um, uh, just mount it on the slit lamp like you put an applanation tonometer and then you expose the eye to um, the UV just like you would in, in a microscope. You can select different protocols at the touch of a button and go ahead and cross-linking, cross-link it, wash after uh, the procedure. You can again recline the chair unit, wash with saline and put a bandage, bandage contact lens and close, uh, remove the speculum. So basically it removes the need to have a um, operation theater. So even in remote areas, you could do it and hopefully this should be reasonably priced. That's what we've been given to understand. And if it is, I think it could be something very useful for a country like India. So to conclude, cross-linking um, is, uh, of course, a wonderful procedure. The longer duration protocols are certainly more effective. So a good compromise and accelerated is to go for the 9 milliwatt. Uh, cross-linking can be combined with surface ablation or intracornial ring segments in selected cases. Uh, pack cross-linking may be an adjuvant tool in microbial keratitis um, and may be used as something to do before you go for more uh, um, invasive procedures. Adapted fluence cross-linking, I think, is the, uh, is the future. Uh, and I think this may also make accelerated protocols more effective and also be useful for thin cross-linking, thin cornea cross-linking. And slit, slit lamp cross-linking might be uh, good to increase access and reduce cost. Thank you for your kind listening. Thank you very much, Rishi. I think it was a wonderful overview of um, actually very vast topic because as we know uh, that cross-linking has been described in uh, late 1990s and since 2003, we have been applying it uh, like human studies started in 2003 and it is commercially available since almost 2005 to seven. So there is a vast area of literature which is already available, which has shown that cross-linking is very, very effective in stopping progression of keratoconus. And in this journey, there are a lot of newer advancements which have happened to make cross-linking more uh, efficacious, more safe, and also improving certain aspects of cross-linking, such as improving the refractive outcomes. So uh, first of all, excellent presentation, Rishi. I think uh, all this journey you have really summarized very well in a short 12 to 15 minutes talk. I would like to just make a few comments before I go to the questions to you. And uh, one of the things that you have spoken about uh, was uh, the CXL plus uh, approach in which uh, what we essentially do is we combine the collagen cross-linking with different kinds of refractive procedures 
so that uh, not only the keratoconus is stabilized, but also the visual acuity can be improved in these patients. And uh, the approaches that you've already discussed has been with uh, topographic added PRK, with CXL, which is the Athens protocol, uh, the TPTK with CXL, which is the Cretan protocol. Uh, so when it comes to the Cretan protocol, uh, we have already uh, now our group with Kim Yonis has published uh, six studies so far, and one has been now a long-term study of four years. And as you mentioned, uh, we have shown that uh, there is definitely an improvement in quality of vision in these patients because we are actually smoothening the topography of the patient without actually doing a topographic added treatment. So one thing I'm adding to it now is that there is a new thing that we are uh, studying currently and we are about to publish soon is called as a Cretan Plus approach. So what is a Cretan Plus approach is that as we have discussed in Cretan protocol, we remove the epithelium by TPTK and then we do cross-linking. So this TPTK, because of the masking epithelial where, uh, differential thickness, gives a simulated effect of topography-guided treatment. So in such patients who don't have enough thickness for uh, topography-guided PRK per se, uh, but have slightly more thickness than only Cretan protocol, now we are actually combining the TPTK with a conventional PRK, very, very minimal, not more than 30 microns, and then combining it with the cross-linking treatment so as to give a, a simulated effect of a topographic guided PRK along with cross-linking in these patients. And now I think we have more than two and a half years of follow-up of these patients. Probably next early year, it should uh, get published. Uh, second thing which you mentioned was about mitomycin C, uh, which is absolutely true, is that use of mitomycin C in topographic guided PRK with CXL combination has been quite controversial. Although Canolopolis group is uh, basically of the opinion that mitomycin C is useful for them. Uh, but uh, as you are doing uh, right now, and we have also been not using mitomycin C at all, is uh, because uh, apart from the uh, haze and the hyperopic shift that the mitomycin C cause, uh, the real pathophysiology of the post-PRK haze is because of the activated anterior uh, keratocytes. So what we know from the confocal uh, studies of cross-linking is that after we have done cross-linking, we essentially depopulate the 300 microns of corneal cells, which includes nerves, which includes keratocytes. So essentially for the next three to six months, we don't have enough keratocytes to repopulate and cause post-PRK kind of haze in this situation. So this is one of the reasons that we don't use mitomycin C per se. Now, there are some questions, um, uh, Rishi, I would like to ask you is that uh, there are a lot of general ophthalmologists now in this forum. And uh, I would like to just for their uh, understanding, I would like to tell you, uh, ask you is that when would you really ask, like, uh, let the general ophthalmologist suspect earliest keratoconus in their practice? Like a lot of people go to this GP, uh, general practice, a comprehensive ophthalmologist and they have change of spectacle numbers and other things. But when would you actually tell them that they should get a topography done or a pentacam done to rule out keratoconus? So I think in a general practitioner's point of view, some of the simple tips that I would suggest is look at your auto ref. And if your auto ref is not really matching your subjective acceptance, that especially when the cylindrical component is very high in the auto ref and the patient is accepting a lot lesser, that should be a red flag in your, uh, in, in your this thing. An increase, of course, an increase in your cylinder uh, from previous visits, especially a rapid increase, is again a red flag. Uh, a retinoscopy would, of course, uh, be a dead giveaway. You would get a scissor reflex. So I would recommend that any doubtful case, any cases that you've been labeling as uh, amblyopic also, sometimes you'll be surprised. They're actually keratoconus. And you've just been you know, uh, telling that patient that we can't do anything for you because you're amblyopic. And if you were just to try and do a cycloplegic refraction, you would pick up a scissoring reflex. So these are the, some of the simple things. Some patients complain of like a double vision, you know, when they see, they see a ghost image. And that's again, one of the important symptoms what, that you shouldn't ignore. You, you would attribute it to astigmatism, but it may actually be because of the irregularity in the cornea. So, and of course, uh, fluctuating acceptance, if your op optometrist has got a different acceptance and if when you're rechecking it, if you're getting something else, Every visit is a little different. Those things are little pointers. And of course, the clinical signs on the slit lamp, looking for Vogue striae, the profile of the cornea, look at focal thinning. Um, those things, of course, we all know the signs of keratoconus, but those are in more advanced cases. In the early cases, it's these little pointers which will tell you. 
Yeah, great. I think that those were great inputs. So, Rishi, we also know uh, that the pediatric keratoconus behaves quite differently than the adult keratoconus. So, would you like to throw some light on that? Yeah, so pediatric keratoconus is one entity uh, which is highly over-diagnosed, I would say. Uh, many people who are labeled as pediatric keratoconus are not pediatric keratoconus. That's the first thing I would like to say because there's a lot of general ophthalmologists here. Please remember, pediatric corneas are a lot steeper than adult corneas. So if you're seeing a 50 diopter, uh, even a even 50 diopter cornea uh, may be actually quite normal for a pediatric eye. And as the child grows, that cornea will flatten. So unless you're seeing frank asymmetry in your uh, Myers, or if you're seeing skewing in the Myers, uh, which, are, which are typical signs of keratoconus, I would please ask you to refrain from cross-linking these patients because you will be end up exposing this child to an unnecessary procedure you will, uh, and the risk of general anesthesia if you're going to be doing it on anesthesia. Uh, please take a second opinion before you cross-link a pediatric keratoconus. That's something I would like to say at the outset. Um, steep case does not mean keratoconus in pediatric eyes. But if you do have a frank keratoconus, uh, you must certainly think about cross-linking these eyes at the earliest because pediatric eyes do progress and progress rapidly. You, may, you, may, you can miss the bus very quickly. So uh, just be sure of two, three things. They should not have an active uh, VKC or an allergic conjunctivitis. The eye should be quiet. So if they have an active allergic disease, quieten that. Only then go for cross-linking. If you can do it under topical, very, very often uh, you will be surprised at how cooperative these children can be for a procedure like uh, uh, cross-linking. So it may be a good idea to consider um, uh, uh, an accelerated protocol as a first approach in some pediatric cases, if you can avoid the risk of GA. And if uh, once the child is a little old, older, you can do a repeat procedure as a full protocol. That may be the only um, condition in which I would say it may be okay to go for an accelerated. Otherwise, go for a standard protocol and don't wait to document progression in a child. Please go ahead and cross-link cross these children immediately. If possible, you can do both eyes also in the same setting if you're uh, giving general anesthesia. Right. Yeah, those are think, my points. Yeah, I think that is an excellent point because as we know, in adults, we always wait for progression because we always want to document progression, then only do cross-linking. But if it is a, it's a genuine case of pediatric keratoconus, then they can progress rapidly and almost 98% of them are shown to progress. So I think um, doing cross-linking uh, even immediately after cross, uh, diagnosis is okay. Uh, if it is a pediatric true keratoconus, as you have One said. more point, uh, Vadam, I forgot to say is we must remember that the longevity of cross-linking is limited in uh, children because of the collagen turnover that happens over years. So it's shown that after three years, there's a ch significant chance of progression. So please make sure you are calling these patients regularly at four to six months intervals and repeating their parameters. And if you see progression, you may have to repeat after three years or so, two to three years. Yeah, that's an excellent input. In fact, it should be included as a special consent probably in these patients if required. Yeah. Uh, another thing I would like to discuss is the customized cross-linking that we discussed and, um, and that you had mentioned. And it is very interesting concept in which you actually do a focal cross-linking uh, around it. Uh, now you are a corneal transplant surgeon and uh, you have seen that when we do corneal transplants, we always uh, include the whole of the fleshless ring. And sometimes we have seen that there can be ectasia even beyond that. Uh, so when we actually think about the concept of this customized cross-linking or very focal cross-linking, what is your opinion about it? So, Vardaman, we are basically uh, doing a higher fluence at the uh, apex of the cone, but you are treating an area which is beyond the cone as well because the final uh, ring is the whole uh, cornea as well. So uh, you would uh, treat the entire area. And we all know that cross-linking does cause flattening. Yeah. So essentially, you're causing more flattening. The only concern is of safety. But some uh, publications are showing that it's quite safe. So I think uh, it has a role. But problem is that uh, the machine uh, is not available freely. And it's very expensive. Only right. few people have access to it. You could try to do it uh, manually also with your standard machine. But it's not very easy. I've tried to do it by using some sort of disc, but uh, it's not very easy to do. 
so we have an interesting question and this is uh, about are the follow different in thinner corneas as compared to corneas about 400 microns after crossing uh, vardhaman vardhaman yeah. this is the last question we we'll yes. we'll so i think we will we'll conclude with this question is yeah. that uh, if you have a thinner cornea versus a relative with thicker cornea will your follow ups be different after crossing king uh not necessary i think i would follow up the same way because my outcome measures are going to be the same and uh, of course i have not done too many but uh, the few that i have done the results are pretty good all right thank you so much rishi i think it was thank amazing you. presentation a lovely to interact with you again thank fantastic. you fantastic thank you both of you all thank you vardhaman thank you rishi such an amazing and interesting topics i am sure there are a lot of unanswered questions still we need to move on to our next section now our next section now is uh, oculoplasty and uh, again we have two uh, you know it's absolutely dynamic uh, people with us in this field there's dr shubhra goel from hyderabad welcome dr shubhra and we have dr aditi watwe from kolhapur welcome dr aditi uh, sapnesh i think you'll have to unmute her dr aditi can you hear us okay i'll start with introducing dr shubhra dr shubhra goel of oculofacial aesthetic surgeon with over 13 years of experience in this field she has done more than 5000 surgeries in various surgeries plastic surgeries reconstructive surgeries and aesthetic procedures and surgeries around name a few the achievement award by the american academy of ophthalmology the ophthalmic heroes award by the aios in 2016 the innovation award by the uh, women ophthalmic society of india she has incidentally uh, she is the first oculofacial surgeon from india to be faculty at the esteemed asia pacific allergen academy and this particular academy you know it imparts knowledge on the medical aesthetic and cosmetic injectables uh, available in this field Dr. Shubhra is also the section editor of uh, Oculofacial Aesthetics for IGO, and one unique aspect, or rather two unique aspects about Dr. Shubhra is that she is a vegan, and her motto is that she believes in natural looks with minimal risks. <laughs> well, along with Dr. Shubhra, we also have Dr. Aditi here. Dr. Aditi, can you hear me now? Yeah, there you are. Dr. Aditi is uh, has done her oculoplasty and oncology fellowship from the famed L V Prasad Eye Institute in Hyderabad. She is a founder and senior consultant at Sunayan Oculoplasty Center in Kolhapur. Her special interests are in lacrimal diseases and the eyelid and facial cosmetic surgery. She has again various awards to her credit: the Young Scientist Scientist Award given by the AIOS in 2012. she's got the best video award for the oculoplasty association of india in 2012 and uh, needless to say that some of her hands on cadaveric oculoplasty wo workshops are a must attend so welcome dr aditi and uh, over to you dr shubhra Uh, thank you, Dr. Preetam, and thank you, BOA, uh, for uh, this wonderful invitation. It's been a wonderful Sunday afternoon. Uh, though I'm little out of touch of all the therapeutic innovations and in other specialty, but it's always good to catch up with what's happening in the field of ophthalmology. Uh, so I'll be just sharing my screen, and uh, let me know if it is visible. Yeah, I, I forgot to mention the topic. Dr. Shubhra's topic for today is facial aesthetic and cosmetic surgeries. around the eye yeah yeah we can see your screen dr shubhra yeah right yeah okay so yeah so the topic which was given to me was what's new in the field of facial aesthetics and um, you know it's kind of a very tricky topic because the facial aesthetics itself keeps evolving every single day and i didn't know whether i would be doing justice to the topic in in 15 to 20 minutes but what i have done is to collaborate uh, what i have been doing uh, over the last few years and how i have changed my approach in dealing some of the cases in facial aesthetics be it surgical or non surgical uh so pritam had uh, very uh, you know very humbly kind of uh, introduced me 
and I just want to bring it to your notice is that I love being fit and beautiful and that's why probably I'm into facial aesthetics. I'm a vegan and I do propagate the plant-based diet for everyone because I've seen wonders with myself and uh, if I'm not doing the facial aesthetics, I love to do interior designer designing. Am I audible to everyone? Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, so, you know, what I would like to start with is that aging is a fact of life, looking your age is not. So I, you know, whenever people talk to me that I want to age gracefully, I said, yes, please age gracefully, but you don't necessarily have to look your age because, you know, you, you have options available. Now, if you look at uh, the grapes and raisins, obviously, uh, being a fitness enthusiast, I would say the raisins are much healthier, but if you want to look to the you know to uh, to have a look of it then grapes are much more attractive and that's where the kind of uh, the uh, decision making comes in terms of facial aesthetics that what should we approach for and the same concept is applicable for facial aging that when we age uh, all the you know baby fat or uh, the tissues which are available which, which are there on the face they start descending and deflating and our aim is to bring them back into position now this is me when i was probably um, five six years old this is my sister out here uh, and one of her friends and this is how i am probably three four years back i had put on weight now have lost weight but what i want to bring to your notice here is that if you look at the younger pictures of yourself and you kind of go through the series of them and compare that you would notice that some of the features which you are born with stay as it is. Now, if you look at my face, I always had a very heavy droopy brows with, you know, heaviness around the eyes. So I'm going to probably have that even more as I age further. But you look at the face, which is oval and more chubbier becomes more squarish. I'm, you know, so what happens with aging is that the triangle changes from the, uh, you know, from the uh, uh, inverted triangle to the square and this is what we want to kind of change now unfortunately what has happened in recent days is that the beauty or the cosmetic industry has become very stereotyped now this was one of the front page covers of vogue magazine and these were the top models of the vogue industry from the vogue uh, you know capital and if you look at all of them they all look very similar they have all have the defined features the height and uh, so called the golden ratio on their faces now is this what we want to achieve in terms of facial aesthetics is is the question mark and as we are discussing it today and then we've been discussing globally that this is not what we want to achieve because um, you know unfortunately the prototyping of the facial uh, cosmetic or the beauty has been uh, kind of taken away by over, over by the industry in a wrong way so what i'm going to discuss here is some of the aspects where patients or the clients walk in to us for ask for the facial aesthetic procedures now some of them come in and they want to age uh, very positively. Now, when I say age positively is that they do want some procedures where they want to just enhance their features a bit or make them a little better so that they still look their age, but the features look much more defined. The other sector of uh, population would come for a real beautification. For example, I can say is that, you know, somebody comes for Botox or fillers and they want to look really different and beautified in, in terms of how they look. The other sector is transformation. Now, when I say transformation, it could be the gender transformation to the feature transformation to anything they're looking for. And these surgeries are picking up in India. And last but not the least could be a correction of a deformity, whether it's a nose correction correction, eyelid correction, a hair transplant, or, you know, even a dental correction. So what I'm talking about is in today's era, it is all about want versus need, what the patient wants and what is needed. So there is a thin line of demarcation where what the patient is wanting and what we can provide and what can be, what is actually needed by the client. So I'm going to take your attention to the emotional questions or the emotional questions of a facial appearance. Now, gone are the days where we used to just, you know, if a patient walks in with, let's say, blephrotosis and we say, okay, you have ptosis, get it corrected and you're sorted. I think the gone are the days because today it's all about how you are feeling. So 
the face uh, and especially the periocular area and the perioral area, and I'm going to come to that a little later, are the two prominent areas on our face, which can actually make you look happy, sad, angry, excited, and so on and so forth. So it's all about what the patient's emotional questions are when they walk in and how they are when they walk out. So it's all about face motions. Now, this is, uh, you know, one of the slides which I picked up from the ASOPRIS meeting. Uh, so there was an artist who was depicting about the facial changes. And this was beautiful, you know. So if you look at the child's picture here, just based on the periocular and the perioral features, you can make out that the, the child is looking a little sad and angry because of the kind of muscular actions which is happening. So the crux of that issue is that if you can work around the periocular and perioral areas mainly on the face, you can actually change the whole concept or the whole emotional question of the face. Now, this can be done both by surgical and non-surgical. I'm just going to touch a little bit on these non-surgical concepts. So there are different modalities which are present today in the market, but I'm just going to talk about botulinum toxin, which is available in different forms and which are FDA approved is mainly the Botox, which is the trade name and the sport. Both of them are FDA approved for cosmetic uh, indications, whereas myoblock is type B, is, which is for neurological uh, indications. Now, this is called the science of biologics. So this is basically the same alcohol in different concentrations gives you different drinks. And similarly, the botulinum toxin, which it is present in different proprietary, uh, you know, in, in different preparations and different formulations or by different companies, give you the different component, which is by different companies available. So basically, the toxin remains the same. And really doesn't matter which company you're using, and you know, provided you understand the pharmaceuticals and the other concepts associated with it. So I don't have any vested interest in one prototype of botulinum toxin which is present in the market, which is by Allergan. Now, looking at the other non-surgical uh, component, which is the dermal fillers, we call the soft tissue fillers, uh, that's the other name, is basically to refill or to relift the uh, tissues on the face. Now, they can be classified based on their longevity placement in a region. Um, so they could be temporary or permanent. Uh, they could be placed on the skin to enhance the hydration of the skin or to support the structures like ligaments and muscles on the bone. And they could be you know, homogeneous or synthetic. Now, what we are going to we are using mostly in our practices is something which is semi-permanent, which is hyaluronic acid filler, which can be used in practically all the layers of the face and uh, which is synthetic in nature. And I'm sure most of you are well versed with these names like Juvederm, Restylane and Perlane. And these are the products which were, uh, which are freely available in India market, though there are other kinds of fillers which is there, but these are, uh, you know, recommended and mostly used for two, three reasons, because they are reversible, the results are reversible, even if you land up in complications, you can reverse them. And they're very easy to inject. So the learning curve is not as longer as the permanent fillers and what they do is that they go into the extracellular matrix of collagen bind the water which is present in the extracellular uh, components and it kind of plumps itself rehydrates and based on their cross-linking and the molecular size is where you place them and get the result now i'm just going to take you through uh, like my patients who have who I have operated and how I dealt with them in previous era and today. So this lady came to me now for a general ophthalmologist or an oculoplasty surgeon. This lady very well has a lid asymmetry. She has a right eyelid ptosis with dermatochelysis. But if you, if, you, if I just bring your notice to how does the patient look? The patient actually looks kind of you know, sleepy, tired, and little old. So if you have to bring this emotional question and change the facial motion of the patient from being so to a much more happier, awake, and a vibrant look is what you would bring on table for her. So this patient was undertaken for the eyelid symmetry uh, surgery, uh, which was combination of blepharotosis and blepharoplasty, upper eyelid blepharoplasty, and a lid crease formation. And the whole, con the whole, uh, you know, the emotional question or the look of the patient changes in that particular manner. Now this is another lady, a similar case. If you look, her eyelid creases are not equal. The frontalis action is not similar. So she definitely has an element of blepharotosis with a symmetrical lid crease. And this is what we do to her. Now, apart from the structural changes which are happening, if you just focus on her, focus on her facial features or the facial question, again, I'm and you know and you know stressing on that point, is that the patient looks much more um, awake, uh, awake and happier. 
obviously the blepharotosis is a common surgery which we produce and it always uh, gives us a droopy or a sleepy look and a tired look and this can be corrected with surgical indications which is blepharotosis surgery now this is about uh, the lower lid blepharoplasty again a very common procedure but what i want to bring to your notice again is when the patient walks in with lower lid bags or the upper lid dermatoculosis with the uh, you know the um, fat prolapse the patient doesn't say that i have fat prolapse and please collect it the patient would come and say everybody is calling me very tired as if i have not slept and that you know maybe i'm drinking a lot if this it's a it's a male patient and doctor what can you do about it so what we do is we undertake the procedure which is very common and there are different advancements in this procedures where we do just fat excision fat fat replacement fat redistribution we can do surgery combi with in combination with soft tissue dermal fillers and give the required look with the patient want now here i haven't gone and done anything to refill the you know the theater of deformity which is present because that's what the patient was wanting and he comes from a, a middle class background and he was happy with what he has and actually speaking his main complaint was that his glass you know spectacles were not fitting on her face on on his face another example where the lady walks in and she says everybody calls me that i'm looking you know angry and um, you know i i i haven't slept for days obviously she is an old lady but she has an upper lid entropion on both side with true and pseudo dermatoculosis and she also had a forehead ptosis with lot of right edges so she underwent an upper lid entropion repair with a brow lift surgery which was done by the mid forehead lift followed by some botox on the upper forehead now coming to the specifics of uh, expressions where you know we have angry looks we have sad looks this is one of the prototype where the patient has a very deep glabular right edges and can be corrected by botulinum toxin as i had discussed in uh, in you know in, in my previous slides again a surprised look or a heavy forehead and a lot of lines on the forehead can be a sign of straining the frontalis muscle quite a bit which is a sign of aging which is a sign of blepharotosis which is a sign of you know patient uh, having too much of an expressive face and that can be corrected with botulinum toxin now eyebrows and eyelid upper eyelid they are a unit so we cannot really work alone on eyelids and not work on the eyebrows now for example this lady who walked in she definitely has the dermatoculosis with ptosis she looks very tired very sleepy the only thing we did was to just lift her brows with chemical talk uh, chemical brow lift now she still looks tired and uh, sleepy but you know they, there is an there is a element of Uh, an awakened look only by the chemical uh, brow lift the reason the other surgeries were not done because patient didn't want to undergo uh, surgical corrections now theater of deformity or dark circles is i feel the uh, bread and butter of all uh, all of us in india because we are a country where we have very prominent cheekbones and we have deep set eyes and the way our fat distribution is present that kind of causes tear from deformity and the dark circles in almost all of us so dark circles and theater of deformity would definitely bring a patient or a client calling for a uh, tired sad uh, you know very very aged look to it whether it's a young patient and an old patient and these can be very well collected with uh, soft tissue fillers which i discussed so here the patient was given hyaluronic acid filler juvederm which is by allegan and we had done the filling of the theater of deformity we did the anterior projection of the mid cheek and also the lateral cheek area to bring out the look which is much more fuller much more you know youthful and less tired for the patient now the soft tissue fillers can also be a replacement for blepharoplasty surgeries in certain cases where the prolapse is grade 1 grade 2 and also the patient is not willing for surgical correction for example this a uh, lady who walked in again the same you know if you look from the facial question is that you know doc i look tired i'm not looking the way i used to look 5 years back and everybody is saying what has happened to your eyes so you can very well go ahead with the surgical correction and redistribution of fat but what i went uh, ahead and did was soft tissue filler placement and this actually takes care of not only the looks but also the emotional question which patient walks in and believe me more than the structural correction the patients are looking for that wow effect and you know the change in their expressions which happens with these treatments 
another case of uh, you know a girl who had had fillers somewhere else and she uh, was not happy with the wrinkles below her eyes so we went ahead and did some botulinum toxins on fillers and also you can see some flaking which was part of the chemical peeling on the skin because we also wanted to enhance her uh, skin uh, you know texture uh, so you know fillers can be done anywhere on the face so you can have individual uh, indications and these are part of the full face rejuvenations but i'm just showing part of it and then i'll come to the full face where the lips were enhanced um, as i said if you just focus on periocular and perioral area most of the patients would change their facial motion from being sad or grade 1 to grade 5 when i say facial motion or the face motion face motion is a new technology where we actually grade and we can rate and tell the patient how much he or she has improved post surgical or post non surgical procedures in terms of the grading of the expressions on the face now double chin is another very very common thing in india we do attribute it to weight gain and the submental fat pads and yes definitely you may need uh, liposuctions and injections like a bella which are you know the fat uh, dissolving agents but we can very well go you know get away with just uh, causing the anterior projection of the chin with soft tissue fillers elongating the chin so that there is a you know a, a illusion of uh, the submental fat not being seen and uh, the chin and the face or the jawline looks more longer <clears throat> and lengthier so another example where the client has a short chin a very small chin not very anteriorly projected and this is what we have done to her and the whole look of the face changes uh, in terms of even golden ratio so the patients can walk in in terms of asking for specific structural changes could ask for certain emotional changes could ask for actually getting their faces turned from square to oval and to the exact golden ratio uh, thing so this is one of the cases which i wanted to bring to your notice is the full face rejuvenation um so where the lady walks in and she says you know uh, just do something on my face so that i looks vibe i look vibrant and i look happier and i look um more of my age i don't want to look different but i want to look better version of myself and this is what we did to her so we kind of played around with the injectables there was no surgical procedure done on her so if you notice her square face has been converted into an ovalish face we have elongated her chin we have softened her jaw lines we have brought the cheek little forward and there has been an anterior projection now there are certain other indications in terms of uh, you know non cosmetic though cosmetic if this lady has a left eye prosthesis and if you look there is an asymmetry she definitely doesn't want to undergo surgery which i had kind of uh, told her that you know there is a right eye or the normal eye ptosis with the lid crease formation which is needed so what we did is we played around with the other eye with the upper eyelid lid loading with fillers and we brought that eyelid down and we kind of made it much more symmetrical than before definitely she needs a uh, lid crease formation in one of the eyelids but this is what best we can offer Row, uh, lower eyelid rolls is very common this is because of the hypertrophic inferior orbicularis muscle and this could be very well taken with uh, again botulinum toxin patients are often sent for surgical indications in such cases but they do very well with injectables now uh, the other exciting part uh, of the facial aesthetics which is not the surgical non surgical but technology driven now fortunately or unfortunately even in facial aesthetics we are getting more and more de dependent on the technology there are machines there are uh, you know agents uh, i mean the um, machines and technology which is coming which is taking over most of the surgical uh, indications so this is one of the patient where now we have started doing the microblading uh, or we call the micropigmentation or we call it the semi permanent makeup um, so i don't want to use the word semi permanent makeup that kind of sounds very salonish so this is where the brow was kind of you know enhanced by doing the uh, the microblading and we can do it for multiple indications like brows the eyelid eyeliners the lip color and even in therapeutic indications for burn scars stretch marks and everything and we have been doing it uh, pretty uh, often now so this is the lip color which was given and this is me uh, i just wanted to try the lash enhancements and they really work wonderful if you're not uh, you know so initially we used to use the lash uh, serums uh, which contains the the um, you know the anti glaucoma medications but uh, the pigmentation is an issue and now we have a lot of different kinds of lash enhancement treatments be it with the glue or with the led which have been done and i just wanted to try on myself before and i know these are being done in salons but i think we are getting more and more into uh, our practices 
now this helps in terms like if i if you see my eyelids also i have very very heavy dermatocalluses and my eyes look deep set the moment you enhance your lashes kind of gives a anterior projection to the whole eyelid and the periocular area and your eyes look bigger and better now some of the other technologies are obviously radio frequency machines or the hifu or the alt therapy or the sigma lifts by different names uh, where we can actually do the non surgical facial lifting and uh, you know there are a number of other machines which are available but because of the shortage of time i cannot really combine everything here but i've just enlisted them as like we have different cosmeceuticals in terms of creams and peels we have derma abrasions we have hydrofacials we have radio frequency skin tightenings and many other radio other Devices. I'm not talking about lasers because that's not our territory. Um, that's not my territory where I practice in it, uh, for that matter. And all of them have become soft procedures. Um, they give those wah moments to patients. They want that look. They want the immediate results. Uh, stem cells or PRP and the combinations are in place. We have been doing facial rejuvenations, hair uh, growth. Uh, you know the PRP for uh, hair loss, which has been there, and there are a lot of combination therapies were there. Now, as I said, these are the therapies which are non-surgical and technology-driven, um, and there is another battery of uh, machines which are available. So maybe uh, we can have another talk for that sometime later. Now this is what I practice uh, for most of my patients is the Zio or the Obaji skincare because I call it as the brahmaster for the Indian skincare. Um, I'm not a dermatologist, but I've been trained by Dr. Obaji to uh, you know uh, treat my patients with this because it works on almost all skin types and all indications in a very protocol-based manner. Um, so uh, this is what we give our patients in addition to all the other treatments which we have been doing surgically and non-surgically. So in the end, I would just say that eat well, sleep well, and exercise well, and lie about your age because once you lie about your age, is where you can actually be a candidate for uh, all the wonderful, beautiful procedures uh, which are present out there in the market. Thank you so much. Fantastic, Dr. Shubra. I like that last statement of yours. Lie about your age. <laughs> That's nice. Brilliant talk, uh, Dr. Shubra. Uh, one question I would like to uh, ask is: uh, Is there any uh, like uh, particular filler which you choose for specific area of the face, or everything is customized according to the patient, or what are the variables basically which need to be considered while choosing a filler? Yeah. So as I said, so I I have been using hyaluronic acid filler, and that is what is available in Indian market. Now I have been trained with the Juvederm range of products, but you can use anything which is which you have been trained in and you're comfortable. Now the products come based on their cross linkage and molecular size. So there are fillers which is for skin hydration. There are fillers for which are for dermal injections. There are fillers for which are for supra periosteal or periosteal injections. So coming to your question about where do you want to inject which uh, filler obviously you would choose from these range of products from a topic a particular brand so for example if you want to just hydrate the skin you know there's something called volite which will you you will use for skin hydration if you want to support the structures you will go for a higher molecular and you know highly cross-linked product so these have these products have specific indications of the area of injection or the plane of injection and then you can play around with these products for sure uh, there were a few more questions from the viewers and uh, yeah, Dr. Sunil Morekar has asked about how do you deal with uh, the patients with body dysmorphic image disorder? Like from my side also, I would like to ask how do you actually differentiate them from a demanding patient and actually some pathological thing which they have and how do you deal with them in your practice? I think the key to all of this is your consultation. Uh, so if you give enough time to your patient or a client and you understand and talk to them in detail, because uh, at least I don't jump into any kind of uh, services when it comes to even functional for that matter, unless I've spoken to a patient at least two, three times. Um, so that is one very important uh, feature. Now, I would just put it that every one of us have an element of body dysmorphic syndrome. Uh, so none of us are away from it. We all start 
in front of the mirror and we don't like one part of us and we wish that it can be corrected. So we have an element of it, but does it become pathological in our body language, in our body system? is what we have to look at. So these patients walk in with very typical features. First of all, the red flags would be they would have gone to 100 people. They wouldn't have liked anybody's procedure. They would come and tell you that that doctor was bad and you were the best and that you are the bestest doctor in the world who are, whom they have come to. And they're ready to pay any amount of fee to you, but make me this and that and this and that, you know. So I think it's based on experience. Plus, it's also a good idea to have a psychologist on board. So if you have patients whom you think are going to be difficult or red flag patients for you, it's a great idea to have a psychological consultation, uh, though it's not easy. But I think uh, most of these patients who come and I figure out that they are going to be a difficult task for me, I actually don't touch them. Okay. Uh, yeah, one more thing. Like, are there any uh, softwares which are available to show the patients how they look? Is, is it uh, acceptable? Or else, how do you actually uh, give an image how they look post-procedure? Because somewhere your uh, image should match their image, then only patients will be happy. It is not about perfection every time. It is uh, how they want, we need to make them like that. So how, how do you deal with that? There are some software, especially in the plastic industry, uh, plastic surgery. I mean, a lot of general plastic surgeons use it. And I don't remember a specific name, but yes, there are different softwares for that. But, you know, you can just give an idea to them. Now, even for Botox and fillers, Allegan has a lot of apps which can give you an idea about how you're going to look if you inject a filler in a particular area and all. So that can give them an idea. But the problem is you cannot be dependent on these apps to tell the patient this is how exactly you are going to look because these are just nomogram-based apps which are just going to give you an idea. So I, I, the way I approach it is, yes, you can use these apps to show the pre and post to an extent that this is what you can you know, uh, you know, probably look like, but this is not what you may look like because at the end of it, uh, it's, it's how the, the body tissue is going to take it and how the results are going to come out is going to vary. And I think the best idea is to show pre and post of real time patients, um, mm -hmm. which are closer to what they have come for. I think that's the best thing to do. Yeah. Even I agree with that point because sometimes showing them something uh, like, uh, if, if it doesn't match that photo post procedure, it becomes a real problem or headache for us when we uh, actually treat those patients. Uh, one more question I wanted to ask, like, what is your, uh, like, do you use autologous fat as filler? What is your experience with that and versus the synthetic fillers? I used to use them initially in 2010 and 11 a lot. Uh, but what I have seen with autologous fat, and this is my personal experience, uh, I mean, there's no right or wrong to it, is that it's very unpredictable uh, for facial, very specific cosmetic indications. Now, if you're doing it for facial paralysis patients or you're doing for depressed scars, it's a wonderful tool because you know that the muscles are paralytic and even if the hypertrophy of the muscle happen, of the fat happens, it's okay. But if you're going for, for example, tear trough deformity and you inject a fat, there are always chances of atrophy and hyperatrophy, lumps and bumps, and if it's not in the right plane. Now, there are, uh, you know, global leaders who are a big proponent of fat injections, autologous uh, micro fat injections, and they've been doing it for ages. But I think uh, in the end, it depends on what you like and what you don't like. In my hands personally, and the kind of clientele we get in India, um, I think patients are much more happier for going for something semi-permanent. Uh, there is one more question from uh, again, Dr. Sunil Murekar. He was asking about the privacy issues when you actually show the photographs of one patient to the other as a pre-procedure counseling. How, how do you manage that? No, so we always take a consent for sure. And also, uh, I mean, it's, it's mainly the consent which is taken that can we use these pictures for showing to other patients uh, or not. Uh, so firstly, that is used. And secondly, I think there are a lot of, uh, you know, pictures available on Google or these stock pictures, which you can use to show. I personally don't like to use the patient pictures too much for my pa other patients. Uh, so it's a great question. Uh, but yeah, you can play around with both the uh, or three parameters which you have in your hand for sure. Another thing regarding lower uh, eyelid blepharoplasty, uh, what is your preferred thing? Like it's fat removal followed by uh, filler or it's uh, fat repositioning or 
how does it work better in our indian patients or it is customized according to your like the patient's need um so you know again i think it's how you're trained and what you prefer in your hands now dr kasturi for example uh, is a big proponent of fat redistribution and fat redraping um i like minimal fat sculpting with dermal fillers because i like dermal fillers quite a bit around that area but i think uh, in grade 1 and grade 2 you can actually get away with uh, you know soft tissue fillers without any surgical indication but if you have a grade 3 and grade 4 you can go ahead with uh, sculpting uh, with redraping or with soft tissue fillers i think there is no hard and fast rule for that and i don't think the ethnicity or the nationality differs in any matter in such cases thanks a lot shubhra for such a wonderful topic and covering almost everything uh, in basics of facial aesthetics thank you thank you aditi and nice seeing you again after a long time yes yes many thanks dr shubhra dr aditi thank you so i think sir. we've had a marathon uh, webinar today uh, one of the need to be very frank one of the need to have these webinars for two and a half hours is uh, you know the mmc uh, requirement for giving one credit point is that the webinar should be two and a half hours but i think it's worthwhile it's worth it all the five sections and the segments we've had today with such excellent speakers fantastic talks all the points and the take homes have been wonderful so i'm going to collectively uh, i think i think i'm going to collectively thank all the faculty in today's webinar and uh, thank all the delegates they've shown a lot of patience been with us for the last two and a half hours so until the next uh, i talk plugged in uh, goodbye to you all have a wonderful weekend or what is left thank you and bye thank you